The rally in stocks and bonds put on pause as investors search for some sort of technical and fundamental support. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifel. Kicking you off the closing bell here in the U.S. And Romain, yeah. uh, those gains, they don't exist anymore. Yeah, we started off pretty strong here, and it looked like we were going to get an extension of the rally last week. Right now, all of the major indices in the red, and it really raises the question here as to what's driving that. I mean, what changed between Friday and today? The only thing that I can pinpoint really is what we're seeing in the bonds landscape. Of course, we do have yields marching higher after mm -hmm. that really vicious rally that we saw last week. But the question, even as we were watching that unfold, Romain, was how much of this is fundamental versus how much of this is technical positioning, et well, cetera. Well, I'm glad you went there because, of course, we started off this morning, everybody sort of looking at that weekly note uh, out by Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley. He's kind of making the case here that the rally we saw last week was a bear market rally. Of course, we've heard this from him before. But he points to the lack of fundamentals support, mm -hmm. the lack of technical support. I mean, you saw what happened with the earnings so far. We've gotten out of the S&P 500. A lot of misses on sales and revenue. And as far as technical levels, there's still a lot of key levels that we still need to retest to provide that confidence. Exactly. And if you are a bull right now and you're looking to the bond market to confirm that view, he did say that what we saw in yields was more about, of course, those lower than expected boosts to those auction sizes. It was yeah. about economic data. But even with that weak economic data, it's probably not going to pull forward cuts. That's his view, at least. And you add it all together, and he's still bearish. All right. Well, let's kick things off uh, to the close here with Andrew Slimmon, Senior Portfolio Manager over at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, joining us from, I believe, uh, beautiful uh, Chicago, Illinois. And Andrew, uh, let's start off, not to pitch you against uh, one of your colleagues. Obviously, you folks are kind of in uh, different departments, if you will, yep. here. But of course, I I'm sure you've seen uh, his general take on some of these rallies that we've gotten over the past few weeks and months here. The idea that this is just a bear market head fake here. Uh, do you buy that? No. A <laughs> um, couple things. I think Katie really nailed why the market's weak today, but strong yesterday, last week, which is, uh, look, with rates where they were uh, going into last week, it's a, a big competitor of stocks, but when, as 10-year came down, that really allowed the reality that third quarter earnings were very good. Companies are reporting good earnings. The estimates for this year and next are not dropping, which means the like year, as we sit today, we're going to see 12 percent earnings growth next year. Maybe it won't happen, but there's no sign it, it won't. So I think all the market needed was rates to come down, and that really lit uh, the market higher. Now, today, mm -hmm. the reason why the market sold off is you're seeing rates go the other way. As Katie pointed out, rates have gone up a little, and that's why it's weak in the market. So the stock market really well, is being driven off of the bond market because the fundamentals yeah. are coming in pretty good. Well, that sort of shows and I guess reflects some of the day-to-day -day moves, the day-to-day -day volatility, if you will, here, Andrew. The longer-term trend, though, I mean, when you look at technical levels, when you look at corporate fundamentals, which, according to you, at least this earnings season, has been relatively decent here, does that sort of put together the idea that there is much more upside to come rather than more of a downside? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue with a lot of upside is the market's not cheap. Uh, even uh, going into next year, you're still looking at a market PE that's pretty high. So uh, what the what has disappointed the bears is the denominator, the E, hasn't collapsed the way they would uh, they believe. Uh, but what's frustrated the bear, uh, the bulls, is it's hard to see a lot of upside with. 10 year at four and a half to five percent in the market trading in multiple. So I think we'll get a rally into year end, uh, but I'm not sure that the, there's a lot of upside, you know, as we look out into next year. And I want to talk a little bit more about the bond market because, OK, the 10 year yield, it's not at five percent. It's back to four point six percent. It's still at 4.6%, which is very high looking at recent history. If we stay near these levels, say 45 to 5%, what pressure does that put on different parts of the equity market and what parts actually manage through it? Well, I mean, overall, the market's trading kind of in a, 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 a valuation that's okay in today's, you know, where the 10-year is. If it, you push north of 5%, 
stock market's too expensive. So I think we're I think you, the 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 stocks to focus on are companies where their fundamentals are better than expected because I have a hard time seeing valuations being repriced higher. So I think you want to focus on companies doing well and this is why the magnificent 7 are leading the market. I dismiss the the market seeing poor breadth. The reason we're seeing poor breath is those companies, the very largest, they're reporting the best numbers, the strongest, not all of them, but overall, cumulatively, they've had the best revisions. So I think that's where you want to focus on companies that are exceeding fundamentals, because I don't see a lot of PE expansion. Andrew, that's so interesting, because we talk to a lot of people who see what's happening with those seven stocks, and they say, stay out of it you know don't put all your eggs in that basket maybe you're not saying put all your eggs in that basket but it sounds like you're certainly not shying away katie the one of the biggest i've been in this business a long time and one of the biggest errors that i see investors make is they look at a pe and the e is based on analyst estimates for, for the coming year and they assume that's accurate so they have they determine whether the stock's attractive or unattractive based on the PE. The flaw in that argument is if you look at the Magnificent Seven, their earnings estimates, their income estimates since the beginning of the year are up 11%. So if you had said at the beginning of the year, well, these stocks are expensive, I don't want to buy. Well, you've been wrong because the E is actually higher today than it was uh, at the beginning of the year. Likewise, the S&P equal weighted their earnings estimates are lower today, marginally, than they were at the beginning of the year. So as much as at the beginning of the year, it said, well, the equal weighted is cheap. Well, actually, it's not as cheap as expected because the E has come down. Yeah. So always be very wary of the assumption that Wall Street's got the earnings outlooks correct. It's not proven to be the case for those very large stocks this year. Is there a case to be made then, Andrew? I mean, based on that idea that is there a broader market story, meaning for those folks who do buy this market as a basket, if you will, whether it's through mutual funds or ETFs, or is this much more of an individual stock, individual sector story that investors should focus on? Well, I think it's been very hard for active management because, in theory, it's hard to overweight stocks that are very big in the index. Uh, but I think that's what you should do. So I think the S&P cap weighted, the S&P 500, will continue to outperform the equal weighted. And I think those very large stocks are not as expensive. So I, I dismiss the, well, it's similar to the dot-com bubble. That's not true. Uh, I think those stocks will lead. So I think as from a stock selection, that would certainly be a portion of where I would put my money. I would offset it with some of the value names that I think are also reporting pretty good numbers. And I think they're attractive. Andrew, always great to talk to you. Andrew Slumman there, a senior portfolio manager at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, helping to kick things off to the close here on this Monday afternoon. Coming up in just a little bit, a closer look at OpenAI, now revealing a new chat GPT product that it says puts users in control. Details up ahead. Plus, the cash pile reaching record heights over at Berkshire Hathaway. Doesn't quite tell the full story. We're going to have more on that next. And a look at the state of M&A. Ethan Klingsberg, Freshfield's head of U.S. corporate and M&A, who's going to be stopping by to talk about the outlook for deal making. That conversation and so much more coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. It's DC FinTech Week and Bloomberg is on site. Live from Washington, Kaylee Lyon speaks with Grayscale CEO Michael Sun and China and others. Tune in for a special one hour episode of Bloomberg Crypto. Bloomberg, context changes everything. Well, the Fed is out with the latest senior loan officer opinion survey. Of course, an important look at the availability of credit in the third quarter. Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Editor Michael McKee joins us now for more. And looking through the details of this report, what's the takeaway here, Mike? 
Uh, what's interesting is that it, basically things haven't changed very much. We thought maybe because of what Rafael Bostic had told us on Friday about uh, having read the slews and uh, having talked to a lot of bankers that we'd see a significant tightening of standards, but that's not the case. They actually loosened a little bit in terms of the percentage of banks reporting tighter standards. 3.4 percent of large and middle market banks uh, to large and middle market firms in terms of lending have raised standards. It was 4.6 percent in the second quarter. And those who say they've tightened somewhat, 32.2 percent, also a little bit less than in the second quarter. The overall numbers, though, show most banks not changing their standards yeah. for loans. Now, we're talking about loans not used for M&A. Uh, the inter other interesting thing is, in terms of loan demand, we're looking at uh, demand by large firms is stronger than it was in the second quarter, but still down by 31 percent, and for small firms, uh, down 49 percent. So companies yeah. aren't lending. Banks may not have to. Uh, I mean, companies don't want to borrow, so banks may not have to raise standards. One thing I'm curious about here, Mike, I mean, you had a chance to sit down with Rafael Bostic uh, last Friday, I believe, where he mentioned the slews, basically yeah. kind of said, look, I've, I've actually seen it, and I kind of know credit conditions are tightening here. Kind of reconcile that for us based on his comments that presumably was rooted in him having some insight into the data and the numbers that we got just today, which seemed to just show nothing really changed dramatically. Well, the bankers aren't, uh, at this point, um, raising standards, but they do seem to be uh, clamping down a little more on the size of credit lines uh, and the length of term for which they are lending. But it's not major. Yeah. Uh, overall, I guess, Bostic talking in terms of uh, for the year to date, uh -huh. we have seen a tightening, but it's not a major deal. Now, a lot of people are wondering if we're going to see more, and that was kind of what a lot of the uh, Fed may have gone too far or recession calls uh, for the economy are coming from the idea that this is going to start hitting lending. Uh -huh. But if people aren't borrowing, it isn't, it isn't going to hit lending nearly as fast. And, of course, we know everybody, uh, all, all the businesses and yeah. people turned out their uh, lending, even yeah. if the government did not. All right. I'm Michael McKee, our, our chief economics correspondent here, helping to break down the later senior loan officer survey out of the Federal Reserve, showing that that tightening of credit conditions, well, not really dramatically different than what we saw in the previous quarter. In fact, the folks over at Bloomberg Economics have been tracking this pretty closely, and they're actually out with a new model, which actually tracks the overall price of money over the last half century in 12 advanced economies across the globe. Spoiler alert. They've gone up. Bloomberg Economics Chief U.S. Economist Anna Wong joining us now to talk a little bit more about this. And we obsess over this, this slew's data primarily because we are trying to track the price of money. And we know, at least anecdotally, and I guess the data shows it too, that it's a lot higher than what it used to be. Yeah, I mean, the, our model looked into the factors that has been driving the secular decline of nominal interest rate over most of the 2000s, and it concludes that it's the demographics um, and also a slower growth that led to less demand for money and more. Um, so as a result, nominal interest rate was uh, declining for most of the decade. But looking forward, projecting forward in the next 20 years, 30 years, our model is showing that because of the aging of Americans, also there's less demand coming from foreign central banks. Overall, that would mean that there would be overall less savings uh, relative to demand mm -hmm. uh, for, for money, and hence um, the nominal interest rate likely would be between 4.5 to 5 percent over the next, uh, the 10-year nominal. So it would basically have to go up, or at least stay yes. elevated to keep it uh, Yes, in yes, buyers structurally that, gotcha. that is the trend. And what would that mean for the U.S. government? There's a great table in here that basically says the U.S. government, it got a free pass as rates fell. Obviously, that dynamic is reversing right now. Right. Uh, actually, today we also had a piece out on the terminal looking at what if interest rates stay higher for longer. So. Uh, currently, market-based interest rate is about one percentage point higher than CBO's assumptions. Hmm. So uh, baking that in, it means that the U.S. federal debt-to-GDP ratio could be reaching 170 percent of GDP by 2040, which is through the roof. And what it also implies is in order to steady the um, federal debt to GDP ratio, the U.S. government likely to have to embark on some kind of fiscal consolidation. Well, I, I'm curious about that, though, because I just want to push back. There's been so much made about the widening of the debt, particularly in the current year, uh, and the idea uh, of just what is almost doubled, I think, was the number I saw here. But was that really a mechanism of fiscal stimulus, of fiscal policy? Because I thought that was more
more related to the fact that we had some pretty significant changes to our tax laws that meant we collected fewer taxes. Well, I think it's half-half, Romain. Yeah. I think if you look at the drivers of the deterioration, half of it is due to lower receipts and half of it is due to more spending. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of the lower receipt, fortunately, the Treasury um, just announced a couple weeks ago that it looks like the receipt picture is improving yeah. surprisingly strong. And we also um, are due to get some tax receipts from California, which has been postponing the deadline for the tax receipts, um, and that likely will come in the next couple of months. So um, I think that um, what what this means looking to the future is that, yeah, it's, it's true that the deterioration of fiscal position may not replicate itself next year because there, there's some one-off like fiscal deficit ballooning uh, driver this year. But um, at the same time, the, the receipt picture could de uh, de deteriorate very quickly if there is a recession. All right, Anna, it's really fascinating work. Really appreciate you stopping by to break it down. That, of course, is Anna Wong, Bloomberg Economics Chief U.S. Economist. And I mean, just to live a little bit longer in hypothetical land, if we do enter that environment where rates are sustainably higher, the price of money goes up, a winner would be the savers, theoretically. Yeah, in theory, yeah, it would be here. And I, mean, I think that's what we've heard, at least from a lot of the sort of uh, uh, financial advisors and stuff, basically saying lock in these rates. If you're of a certain age uh, right now, I mean, and you're looking at, you know, four, high fours, 5% on treasuries, mm -hmm. basically risk-free, and even on investment grade corporate, you're looking at six, seven, eight percent on some of those names. Yeah, why wouldn't you lock that in? Yeah, and that's really a once. A, I mean, if you believe that inflation will be in check mm -hmm. and not going to be runaway, you're locking in gains. Solidly positive real yields. Obviously, that's great news yeah. for savers. Not so great for the U.S. government, but that's a for another yeah. day. The U.S. government will work itself out. They'll right? be fine. In the grand or, or it'll implode and. <laughs> it will just, it'll just be anarchy on the streets. Yeah, well, so. stay tuned to find out. But coming up, do you remember what then, New York was like back in like the seventies? I was not close to a lot. Oh, okay. I was right. hoping you could tell me. <laughs> Maybe you, in Katie the commercial Carson. break. <laughs> coming up, record shorts, hedge funds extending their treasury short positions to a record just at the wrong time. We'll have the story coming up next. This is the close on Bloomberg. There's some big bets going on among the leverage funds out there, the hedge funds, extending short positions on treasuries. They extended those uh, big bets to the downside. Katie Greifeld last week, that's the latest CFTC data that goes through Tuesday here. And of course, we know what happened the three days after that, which was basically we had the biggest rally that we've seen in benchmark treasuries going back to at least to March of this year. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty amazing just to think about the timing because the bulk of the move did really start at 8.30 a.m. on Wednesday morning. Of yeah. course, we had the refunding, the smaller than expected boost to auction sizes. Uh, we had some data in there as well. We had Jerome Powell himself apparently speaking and apparently the market taking it as a pretty dovish message. One thing I'm curious about, too, is, I mean, there's been so much talk about how some of this isn't really so much people betting specifically here on an upswing in yields down in price, that some of this is part of these sort of uh, basis trades mm -hmm. and other sort of pairs trades that basically require them uh, to go short uh, the treasuries in order to sort of capitalize on that. Let's see what uh, Ed Harrison has to think about this. Uh, he covers this uh, for us here at Bloomberg, uh, one of our editors at large. And Ed, I, I mean, maybe give us some insight here when we talk about these big short positions, not just what we saw in the most recent week, but the idea that they've been holding on to these short positions, building them ever higher, despite the fact that there seems to be some evidence here that that potential downdraft from prices might actually be over. Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting uh, uh, look that we saw last week because mostly what we saw is an unwinding of that short, which is uh, at the longer end of the curve, that is, you know, for higher, uh, longer maturities. Now, um, the question is, is what, what did that all mean other than the unwinding of those short positions? Because it definitely doesn't uh, point to a recession per se, because when you have a recession, usually what you would see is a rally in the front of the curve as people expect rate cuts to happen. And we really didn't see that. What we saw was more of a rally at the back end of the curve. And so really what we're seeing now is therefore a reset 
of the uh, of the of the short positions to a um, to now what we have is a higher position in yields than we had say three or four months ago, and from here we'll see whether or not the term premium starts to. Uh, to increase as we get that flood of treasuries that's going to be released in the next couple of months. Well, Ed, as you point out, shorting the long end is very different from shorting the very front end in terms of the message or perhaps anywhere in the intermediate part of the curve. When you think about the big short that has been amassed, where is it concentrated or is this really across the curve? I think that the big short is definitely concentrated at the at the long end of the curve, which is why we saw the price action that we saw. It was interesting that Stan Druckenmiller, he talked about uh, the two-year. That's a place where he sees a lot of value. And the reason that he was saying this is because even though there's still the potential unwind, uh, you know, a re-putting on of these shorts uh, on the long end of the curve, really the two-year, the 12-month uh, Treasury is not that much uh, far away from, uh, you know, the Fed funds rate or, or the very, very short end uh, cash. And so you can move into those those levels and really not lose a whole lot of, um, of yield, yet at yeah. the same time you're protected if, uh, you know, if things were to uh, unravel in the economy. I, I am also curious, too, though, about the influence or maybe the lack thereof of some of the foreign buyers. There's obviously been a lot of talk about Japan and its yield curve control and how that might actually be coming at the expense, or excuse me, the abandoning of that might be coming at the expense, of course, of uh, them holding treasuries. Is there any sort of credence to that idea? Is that actually showing up in the data? Well, you know, I think in terms of the term premium, that's how I'm looking at it. And I think this is a good week to think about uh, term premium, the lack of foreign buyers, things of that nature, because what we'll see is without data, because the next piece of big data that we have is the CPI, which is on the 14th, we'll get a good feel for what the market tone is. I mean, today we're already seeing the five-year up 10 basis points. So what we're seeing is, is people recommitting to that trade. That is, is that the term premium is, is coming back into the market and people are uh, they're forced to, to um, you know uh, to pay more or, or actually they're they're forced to have higher yield for those longer yielding assets. All right, Ed, always great to talk to you. Ed, Ed Harrison there uh, helping us uh, break down some of the moves, Katie Greifel, that we've been seeing in the Treasury market here. And I don't know, it's kind of anybody's guess as to sort of what's actually really wagging things here. But I think what most people do know here is that this is not a reflection of normality. Yeah, not at all. I mean, you think about some of the record short positions and how that's potentially distorting the market. I mean, we know that tre Treasury liquidity has just been coming down and really evaporating. Now, at the same time, you have this record short position. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a recipe for volatility. And I'm curious, too, about, I mean, you hear so much talk from some of the Fed speakers about this basis trade. I think it was Lisa Cook today uh, brought that up here. This seems to be on everyone's radar. I don't know if this is just sort of the boogeyman under the bed or if there is legitimate reason to be concerned about this. Well, I'm sure we're going to be talking about it. We sure will here as we continue to count you down to the closing bells here on this Monday afternoon. Socks on the back foot, so to our bonds. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. We're about 30 minutes into the program. We've talked about stocks. We've talked about bonds. We haven't talked about commodities. Abigail Doolittle, she's standing by right now with our commodities close. And we're looking at a little bit of a slide. So overall, the Bloomberg Commodity Index is basically flat down slightly. New York crude had been higher earlier. It's still higher, but I should say off the highs uh, at this point up about uh, half a percent. And the earlier gains, this paired gain, it comes as Saudi Arabia and Russia are sticking to their planned oil cuts amid the Middle East tension. Now, you can see natural gas, on the other hand, down 7 percent, in fact, heading to its worst day uh, since April. European natural gas is down sharply, too, uh, on the full storage and mild weather they're experiencing. I would say, thankfully, we're experiencing some mild weather here in the States, too, weighing on natural gas. Platinum down 3 uh, percent, extending some of the losses there as there's less of a bid for some of the precious metals. And then, finally, cotton down for a second day in a row, uh, down about 2 percent. And from its September high remain, well, we have cotton in a correction, down about 13% or so. Nice wrap up there by Abigail. A closer look at the commodity space. Let's turn now to artificial intelligence. A lot of news in that space from the tech makers and those on the regulatory side. OpenAI, that's the firm behind ChatGPT, kicking off its first developers conference 
in downtown San Francisco. This comes as lawmakers on Capitol Hill and Washington are set to lead a flurry of AI-related hearings this week. Ellen Hewitt joining us right now to help us break it all down. Bloomberg News tech reporter out there in San Francisco. And let's start off with OpenAI because, of course, they are the darlings out there. New features for ChatGPT, Ellen. Give us a sense here exactly as to what they're trying to accomplish here with this conference this week. Well, the conference is their first ever developers conference, and this is a big rite of passage for um, major tech companies to host a conference in which they bring together all these, you know, in this case, it's hundreds of developers from around the world who are flying in um, because they want to learn more about how to use GPT and other um, tools that OpenAI makes available to them um, so that they can build their own, you know, like uh, specified chatbots on top of that. And so it really is kind of a gathering of OpenAI is maybe most devoted customers, the kind of people who are going to build tools that you or I, the end user, might use that are actually relying on OpenAI's technology underneath. Um, so it's just a, a big day for the company and, and a sign of them having reached a certain level of maturity. Well, and I really like the phrase rite of passage. And in your column, you point out that a lot of these conferences come with a lot of show. For example, Facebook bringing on Andy Samberg. I believe at Google's they had a skydiver, et cetera. Uh, maybe we won't see people falling out of the sky, jumping from planes when it comes to what we're seeing at this conference. What is the most meat that we can expect, though? So, there, you know, there was a keystone, I'm sorry, um, uh, like a key address, keynote address this morning from Sam Altman, the CEO of AI, um, OpenAI. And basically, they're going to be talking about, you know, announcements of new tools, different, um, more powerful models that people might be able to use. So for the developers, it's really kind of nuts and bolts stuff. They want to understand, are there going to be changes about pricing? Are there going to be changes about the API, ways that we can integrate our tools with theirs. So the actual meat of the conference tends to be pretty in the weeds. But yeah, in the past, Silicon Valley companies have tended to have these big flashy um, keynote addresses um, that yeah. you can, you know, you can picture the CEOs on stage announcing new features. I, I am curious, Ellen. I mean, when we talk about sort of, I guess, uh, the competitors to ChatGPT, there are a lot of people, of course, who kind of, you know, look at uh, Google and uh, what is it, Bard or whatever they're calling it, and kind of mock that. And of course, uh, Elon Musk or Elon Musk out with his own rebellious uh, Chat uh, GPT AI, whatever you want to call it. Here, are these like formidable competitors to OpenAI? I think we're going to be seeing so much competition in this space. And even Sam Altman has talked about this as well. OpenAI has captured the imagination of people with ChatGPT because I think it was the first time that a lot of the public was using generative AI chat interfaces. But the truth is, is you're going to be seeing this technology made by a bunch of different companies, whether that is Google, Facebook, OpenAI, Elon Musk's XAI, which, you know, who knows what that's going to look like. Um, <laughs> and in the end, they're going to compete on um, pricing, capabilities, specifications, and there's also going to be competition from open source um, alternatives as well. All right, Ellen, great breakdown. Really appreciate your time. That was Bloomberg's Ellen Hewitt on OpenAI's first developer conference. Now, still ahead on the close, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway hit new, a new record of $157 billion in cash. More on the firm's operating earnings and what bolstered that cash pile up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Booking Holdings, an upgrade to buy over at DA Davidson. Analyst Tom White saying Booking's earnings report last week and its outlook, it shows conviction that consumers will continue to prioritize their spending around travel versus other discretionary items and services. Shares of Booking up 4% on the day. Next up, Paramount Global. Bank of America, which was once bullish about the media company, doubled downgrading it today to underperform for buy. 
and slashing that price target all the way down to nine bucks a share from 32. It's a pretty dramatic move with the analysts saying she's perplexed by Paramount's indecisiveness on shedding underperforming assets like Showtime and BET, which she says could lose value if things continue at the current pace. Those shares losing value by about 9% here on the day. And finally, let's take a look at Albemarle. The lithium maker cut to neutral from buy. This over at UBS with lithium prices turning down again over the last two weeks. And UBS's auto team recently reducing their electric vehicle forecasts due to weaker demand in Europe and here in the U.S. The analyst sees the potential for additional downward revisions to the company's earnings estimates. Those shares also down on the day by about 7%. And those are some of our top calls. We do want to stay in the sell side space and turn to Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. They reported earnings over the weekend and that company's cash pile, that was the big headline, hitting a record $157 billion of cash. That's the result of fewer deals and higher interest rates. Joining us now to talk about the company's performance and more importantly, what they might actually do with that $157 billion is Gregory Warren, senior stock analyst over at Morningstar. He currently has a buy rating on Berkshire. And before we get into some of the actual earnings themselves, I am curious about that cash pile. We know that they've been very vocal about this idea that they just haven't found a lot of things attractive. Things are either too expensive or they just feel like on a valuation basis is not the right time. When do you think, Gregory, it will be the right time to really try to deploy a big chunk of that $157 billion. Well, I think that's one of the things you got to give Berkshire credit for historically is they've, they've generally stayed very, very disciplined when it comes to doing deals or making stock investments. So I wasn't surprised. I mean, this cash balance is going above $150 billion was something Warren, you know, at the 2017 meeting said he wouldn't be able to defend to shareholders, but I think situations have changed a lot in, in those you know six years. Um, interest rates, short-term interest rates right now are you know above five percent, so they're earning a, a pretty good return on that cash balance right now, which they would not have been returning back in 2017. You know, rates were close to zero at that point, and you know as far as deals going forward, I I wouldn't be expecting too much yeah. unless we get a you know a, a significant downturn in the markets or they find something incredible that they can step into well, i mean last year last year's deal with allegheny was was sort of a once in a lifetime uh, piece of business that came their way and I, I think it was a huge perfect fit for the firm. Yeah I mean what was that like a 12 billion dollar deal and then of course whatever the heck yeah. has been going on with Occidental Petroleum and them building up that stake. I am curious though if this isn't about deal making at least in the short term then that means there has to be a focus on uh, their operating units whether you're talking about insurance companies like Geico or some of the consumer facing brands like Dairy Queen and Seas. How are those operational units performing particularly in light of the fact that we're not seeing big deals being made? Yeah, it was kind of a mixed bag during the quarter. I mean, the insurance business was incredibly profitable overall. And, and a lot of that was a Geico it has returned to operating profitability the past three quarters, having gone through a really, really difficult period uh, the, the prior few years. And a lot of that was coming you know, out of the pandemic. You know, all the auto insurers, you know, have really struggled because the cost of, you know, vehicle replacement, the cost of parts, the cost of, ins you know, uh, health uh, uh, costs have gone up significantly. And it's only this year we started to see pricing go up significantly enough to where, you know, these these firms are starting to turn a profit again. So that was a good bit of positive news. And then within the, you know, the PNC, you know, insurance reinsurance business, uh, price hardening has been, been taking hold for, for a good year and a half now. And we've really seen an uptick in underwriting profitability for all the participants. Now, Berkshire in particular benefited because... Allegheny or the purchase of Allegheny last year meant that they were, you know, pushing 25 percent plus earned premium growth year over year and throw on top of that, you know, a, a lot more profitability within that business. And I think I think it was the reinsurance group hit a record level profitability overall. Yeah. Yeah. I, I look back 20 years and I couldn't see anything even close to what they put in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the primary group is really doing a good job as well. And in the last minute or so we have left with you, I want to go back to the cash pile and the fact that yep. there aren't really any attractive deals right now. Of course, we think about Warren Buffett, we think about Charlie Munger, the fact that they won't be with Berkshire forever. When it comes to this idea that maybe they want to do one last big one while still with Berkshire Hathaway, do you think that that pressure is real? I, I think there's probably more of a hesitant on their part to do anything really big 
because again, it would be the last thing that they were remembered for. And I, and I, you know, the, the, the risk there is, 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 is making a bad move and, and have all of your, you know, your history sort of, you know, tarnished a bit, uh, because they did one big deal. I, you know, that said, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a big deal come down the pike, but I think it's, it adds a certain level of additional discipline and caution when they're out there looking at deals, because they want to make sure if they're going to do that deal, and that's the last one they'll be remembered for, it's got to be really special, and it's got to really you know, generate you know, the, the kind of returns that they're expecting from that business. All right, Gregory, this is great stuff. Great to catch up with you. Gregory Warren over at Morningstar, a closer look uh, at the earnings that we got on Saturday, Katie Greifeld, mm -hmm. out of Berkshire Hathaway, which, of course, normally reports on the weekend. I'm sure you were up Saturday. I was going to make the yeah. same joke to you. I assume you <laughs> set your alarm, you tuned in. Yeah. Uh, again, the cash pile is just monumental, $157 billion. Yeah. I don't know. It depends on your risk appetite. But if I was Warren Buffett sitting on that much money, you could buy almost anything, maybe one more before I go. Like, what, what would you buy? Like, another horse or something? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, but to Gregory's point, though, I mean, just about the discipline that they've shown. Because, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, private, comp private equity firms, private capital firms that are sitting on the huge cash piles, and they're just throwing it out the door for some of them to any, any sort of, you know, a lame company that they see because they feel the need to. And, and at least Berkshire has the ability, the mechanism to say, we're just going to wait. Yeah, and it's a great point uh, from Gregory that you're remembered for your last deal, the last thing you did. So yeah. uh, it'll be really fascinating yeah. to see how that plays out. That's why I've been saving up. I'm going to just wait <laughs> to really just do something Drop big. the mic. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about what's going on in the M&A space with the perfect guest. Uh, Ethan Klingsberg going to be joining us. He's the head of U.S. corporate and M&A over at Fresh Fields. That conversation after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us as he does every day at this time. And David, right before uh, we came on air with you, we were actually having a conversation about M&A, at least, or the lack yep. of thereof over at Berkshire Hathaway. They're yep. sitting on a big cash pile. Yep. But I think that's what everybody really wants to know here. There are a lot of folks with that so-called dry powder, and investors want to know when that actually gets to play. That's right. I heard that yeah. discussion. Yeah. One thing I do know Warren Buffett, the one yep. thing that got him to do Warren Buffett is not letting money burn a hole Discipline. in his pocket. Yep. Exactly yeah. right. He's going to make a deal if it makes sense. Yeah. But we do want to talk about M&A because yeah. it's been all over the place. Record year, then it really almost stopped last year. We want to find out where it is today. And we turn to Ethan Klingsberg. He is Freshfield's head of U.S. corporate and M&A. Ethan, th welcome. Good to have you here. Where are we today in M&A? Because as I say, we had a record year, and then it almost stopped dead, and then it was supposed to come back this year. Right. Well, there's a few factors driving us in different directions, and I'll explain them. And I think we're going to end up in a much more frothy period come the beginning of next year. Right now, on the financing side, What's happening is it's taking, even setting aside the high interest rates, there's a lot of money in private credit, and these direct credit funds are making the lending, but they do it in small amounts, and the banks, although they're there for the right deal, they're also not writing big debt checks. So we're seeing lots of deals with very large equity checks. We're seeing a lot of deals, what I call fully equity backstopped, where like the, the equity financing is the whole deal. Mm -hmm. They're willing to step up. So that's going to put pressure on pricing, right? Because there's so much in the equity, you have to look at your returns, right? So that results in stock prices are high now on the market. Yeah. And so it's hard to get there. So I've been in a lot of boardrooms where we get some nice feels from sponsors. And then we say, you know, they're just not hitting us where we need to be. Hmm. So, but the trajectory right now is because of the competition among these direct lenders, they're loosening terms, mm -hmm. they're starting to write bigger checks, there's so much dry powder there in the direct lenders, and the banks are starting to lend more. So if this trajectory continues, by the time we get to the beginning of the year, we could really have some frothiness on well, the well, leverage side. Fixing that frothiness in the first quarter of next year, uh, is time a wasting for a lot of private credit? Because we hear about all the money, the dry yeah. powder sitting out there. Do they have to at some point get that out the door? Because they owe it back to people if they don't use it. Yeah. I mean, there's pressure, but you know, you got to also show the returns. And these guys do their due diligence. They're careful. So... There's a lot of, uh, there's, they're not, there's a tension between, you know, the pressure to use the money to show the returns and be careful. Meanwhile, on the boardroom side of it, there's a lot of pressure to increase profit. 
And that puts a lot of pressure on boards to look for deals with really attractive synergies. Yeah. The problem is, if you're a board and you're going out with a deal that's just barely accretive, right. There's, you're open to a lot of criticism. Well, well, I'm glad you brought that up here. I mean, I used to have uh, one of our old bosses here who used to run this place, used to always kind of scoff at the idea uh, of what was been going on with regards to sort of mergers of equals. I always, always say, oh, mergers of equals, there's no such thing. But as of late, we've seen a little bit more uh, of those mergers uh, of equals, uh, much more so uh, than we have in the past. I think uh, we saw that uh, the deal announced, uh, or, or the speculation around Six Flags and Cedar Fair, yeah, uh, for example. Nice. Yeah. Are we're going to see more of that. Of equals make complete sense, mm -hmm. right? Because you get great synergies. Mm -hmm. You have no premium either way mm -hmm. on the nice side, so nobody's being accused of overpaying. Mm -hmm. The problems you have with those deals are one, psychology, because mm -hmm. by definition, half the executive team, half the board are going to be out of work. One of the H headquarters is going to be phased out. Mm -hmm. The other is antitrust, mm -hmm. right? Because there's often an antitrust issue. Yeah. We're seeing deals. I don't know if you saw the Exxon Hess deal they yeah. announced. In the merger agreement, it says they're going to work potentially for up to two years to get that deal well, clear. I'm, I'm curious about that, though. Does that, is that really discouraging people? Because, I mean, we, everyone looks at that Microsoft Activision thing, which went on for, yeah. I think, almost two years itself. And, but Microsoft stuck by it. I mean, they felt like they could win. And I know Microsoft is an outlier. They have deep pockets, and they are, are behemoth of a company. But are smaller firms or mid-sized firms, are they being scared off by the antitrust issues? No. The, the, there was a time when Lena Khan was first appointed it's, and Cantor was first put in place mm -hmm. where there was real fear. The attitude now that I'm seeing over the last few months in yeah. the boardroom is let's fight. Okay. If we got to go to court, we'll, we'll go to court. So they're not let's scared court. of the FTC and Lena Khan anymore. They're intimidated. You got to select the right deal right. because as I'm saying, you might have to fight for quite a number of months, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes these targets are running out of cash. There was one deal where we had to give financing to the target. So you got to really think, pick your target. And so it means that also that puts pressure on these companies because you just can't do one deal every six months for a serial acquirer. You gotta, you, there's only so much bandwidth. So when you find the right target, mm -hmm. you're going in, and that's leading to more public unsolicited approaches, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think, a sign that market prices are high, but that boards are under pressure to get these deals done. Talking about non-solicited, yeah. <laughs> what about activist shareholders? In the past, that sometimes has been the catalyst for some M&A deals, or right now, for example, but Disney's got some yeah. activists who are suggesting maybe they want to sell some things. Is that an element in your business right now? Oh yeah, well the activism, even when the activists aren't there, <laughs> it's, it's, it's looming over the boardroom. The activists that are showing up, and that's not just the top 10 celebrity activists, but also Long, some long-term holders who are just fed up tend, I'm seeing in the ones that are approaching my clients, much more focused on profitability than the idea of a home run and a quick sale right now. But for many of these companies, it's hard to just pivot to profitability right away because they've got to put money into R&D and marketing and CapEx. And if they realize that they're not going to be rewarded for these long-term plans while they're a public company, they think, well, maybe there's a private equity guy who will, who will tolerate us for the next five years as we get up to speed. Ethan, you mentioned the Exxon Hess deal. That's not the only big deal in recent days. It's been all stock, right. not, no cash involved. Uh, as you advise these boards, how do you advise when you do stock, when you do cash? Right. Well, one important issue is if you use too much stock, you're going to have to get shareholder approval on the buy side. That can be very perilous. There was a company, Ritchie Brothers Auctioneers, went out with a deal where they needed to get shareholder approval. Wasn't that, a pop wasn't that popular? They were able just to get the shareholder approval. So you got to really think hard on getting those buy side approvals. It also adds a degree of execution risk, highly unattractive to the target. And if you're in a competitive process, using too much stock can be a problem there. I'm curious though, when we start talking about valuations, the need or the ability to finance these deals and overlay that with the regulatory environment, not only here in the US, but of course over in Europe and the geopolitical issues coming out of Asia and the Middle East, then you're seeing some of these cross-border transactions yeah. start to pick up. Reconcile that for me. Well, the cross-border deals are very attractive yeah. because you can have the synergies, right? And you don't always have the antitrust issues, mm. right? Because it, by definition, if you're really strong in one jurisdiction, but not in another jurisdiction, but you put these companies together, it could be a beautiful result. You get great, you have enhanced R&D, you can have other savings. And so we're seeing these deals, uh, Smurfit, BAE, UK companies coming into the US. There was just uh, another deal, Fortiva, coming from the US into Germany. 
there's also some very nice, those are industrials, in the tech space, there's some very nice tech hubs outside of Silicon Valley and Tel Aviv. And so, you know, I'm have tech clients who want to buy in the Netherlands, in Germany, UK, there's uh, Italy. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of attractiveness to go uh, overseas. Ethan, this is really helpful. Thank you so much for being with us. That's Ethan Kingsburg. He is Freshfield's head of U.S. corporate M&A. And tomorrow, we're going to talk to John Goff. He's chairman of Crescent Heights, but more important, he owns Canyon Ranch. Yes. You've heard of that. Yes, In case yeah, you need yeah, some yeah. time there, you know, yeah. <laughs> a little spa time. Okay. And we're going to hear from Nobel laureate Michael Spence on, on Friday about what governments need to do about artificial intelligence. That's going to be on Wall Street Week on Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Remain. I'm just a little bit of a shame uh, for you, David, that you didn't actually do your show from Canyon Ranch. Oh, they had you. You have, to, you have to synergize. Yeah, I don't think we have the budget for that, buddy. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. All right, we are counting you down to the closing bells here as you round out into the final hour of trading. Once again, this is a bond market story here on the day. Most of the gains that we saw a little bit earlier in the stock market have largely been erased. Stick with us, Romain Vostick and Katie Greifeld. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's about 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Interesting day here where we had a really st relatively strong open for U.S. equities, Katie, but that unraveled pretty quickly here. And I'm not sure if that was because of the rate story, because rates were already sort of moving prior uh, to the open, or if this was more just about, I guess, I don't know, the dearth of catalysts? Yeah, maybe that. I mean, you look at where we are right now, I think we can call that pretty much unchanged. Meanwhile, that sell-off resuming in the bond market. You take a look at volume today, though, and it's pretty depressed versus what we've seen over the past 20 days in terms of that averages. And yeah. I mean, you think about where we are. Mm -hmm. We've got through a lot of event risk last week. Yeah. In terms of catalyst, I don't know what's next. Yeah, absolutely. And you saw that on the board here, kind of an unchanged day for equities, a relatively uh, interesting day for bonds here. But I thought you did see a rally in some of the metals, particularly mm -hmm. industrial metals. And that seems to be based largely on some reporting that uh, uh, China and its economy are starting to improve things, particularly with the local governments and the purchases. And you take a look at Korea's benchmark index, up 6% here on the day. And that was because they instituted a short sale rule ahead of their election next year. No so kidding. this is going to be in place, I think, for like six and a half or seven months based on when the election is. So basically saying, you know, I mean, there are some exceptions, but more or less, you know, you're not going to be shorting anything uh, off the cops be anytime soon. <laughs> I guess I was planning ahead yeah. and then some. And uh, if you want to make your stock market go up, that's a way to do it. Yeah, I'll flip up the board real quick here. Not getting a lot of juice uh, at all uh, for some of those small caps. We talked a lot about this last week and the downtrend that the Russell 2000 has been on relative to the S&P, relative to the NASDAQ 100. That's the chart you're looking at there. And I put that line there for you, Katie, that blue line. Thank Just you. in case you weren't clear, that was a downtrend. I think I've highlighted it very Yeah, it was accurately. a little fuzzy on it, but the blue line really tells me that that uh, line is going down. And I know that small caps have been suffering even though they have pockets of outperformance last Friday for example but uh, the trend is clear let's talk about some of these individual movers because it is still earnings season and you under the hood you do have some interesting stories to get into I want to start with Constellation Energy so okay. this of course is a utility as you would imagine yeah. and uh, it boosted it nothing e more I like to talk about than utilities of course yeah uh, well the stock market move is pretty exciting today up 6.3 percent after boosting its EBITDA forecast it beat on earnings actually shares hit an all-time high today after that outlook rage so so you look at constellation it's having a good day even though it's a pretty meh day yeah overall uh I you, think, had, you had a gambling stock up there i think for like the third straight day or something yeah i've just been yeah. watching DraftKings rally okay. for about three days straight yeah. they reported last week it was a really good report i think they rallied about 17 percent on the heels of that but the thing is, it's continuing to build. It's up another 2.4% today. Remember, they reported last week a uh, big beat when it came to monthly unique players. They raised their outlook as well. And we'll see how far this thing can go. Maybe I'll have it on the board tomorrow as well. But the expectations were high. They surpassed them. The stock is rallying as well. Let's talk about Tesla. Oh, sure. It's been Why a not? while. Yeah. It's been a while. Uh, there was an interesting Reuters report in the past day or so, and Tesla had been rallying 
on the heels of it. Not so much right now, but the report said that it has plans to produce a 25,000 euro EV at its factory near Berlin. This okay. is according to Elon Musk announcing yeah. this plan to staff last week. He didn't say when production yeah. would start. And this is something that he's been teasing since 2018. Well, I was about to say, I mean, he's been teasing him before that here in the U.S. saying we were going to get like some sub 30 car and that hasn't quite materialized. It hasn't quite materialized. Maybe it will yeah. in Germany. Uh, initially, that was enough to boost the stock. You can see that bid faded. And when you think about the affordable EU made EV market, it's definitely been heating up in terms of Stellantis's efforts, Volkswagen's efforts. And we'll see if Tesla actually does throw its hat into the ring. Absolutely here. Uh, great roundup there, Katie. But Thank can we you. talk about something else? Yeah, let's let's switch gears here. Let's talk about the booming world of private credit. Uh, we've actually seen attempts by some of the biggest names in the space to develop a hot new corner of the one point six trillion dollar market. They've hit a little bit of a roadblock in the form of their peers, actually. Buyers like Apollo, Aries, and more have raised billions of dollars for secondary deals, but restricted buyer lists are threatening efforts to make private credit more liquid. Bloomberg's Shanali Bastic joins us now with more. And Shanali, just set the scene for us. What exactly are we talking about here? So you have to have a little history here. Before 2008, there were tons of insurance companies, pension funds, that had plowed into private assets and couldn't sell when they needed the liquidity. So run up to now, and you have increasingly private uh, credit investors putting more and more money into the asset class, seeking yield, seeking kind of longer duration here. But the big problem is what happens if they need to sell? This is a big unanswered question. And in the private credit market, there are hordes and hordes of restricted buyer lists. These are people who say, we don't want you to sell our fund to one of our rivals because we don't want those rivals to get a picture into what we're doing at our firm. Right. But how, do, how does this get reconciled, though, Shanali? Because you get to this idea of need. I think you use that word need here. When does that need arise? And if so, what options do they have? Well, you think about 2020, for example, or kind of other kind of crunchy periods in the market when the or last year when the market drew down so much. And all of a sudden you have this issue for pension funds and insurance companies who are able to sell their liquid holdings. And people are worried that exacerbates the selling the liquid holdings because they can't get out of other pockets of investment. So you don't know necessarily when that need arises, but it usually arises at the worst possible time. Yeah. And so you have large, large bodies from uh, the Bank of England to the IMF really getting concerned about what happens when the biggest institutional investors in the world don't have the cash they need on hand for the things they need to pay out. Okay, so that in and of itself found, sounds very scary. But the private credit market, I mean, as you know well, it's just been on fire this year, absolutely booming. What are some of the other risks that are rising to the top of the worry list? Yeah, because, you know, it's interesting. The secondary market has been booming in general. It's really provided a lot of liquidity to private equity and private credit. The private credit complication here is that these restricted buyer lists are really concerning to some folks. There's also this other issue here, that when limited partners, these big pensions and insurance companies, when they look across their portfolio, what they're starting to find here is they're invested in private equity fund A, and then all of a sudden pri private credit fund B is invested in the same deals as private equity fund A, and you're having these investors that are doubling down on some potentially risky wagers when they meant to be investing in all of these disparate funds. So all of a sudden there's this concentration risk. And by the way, defaults are rising. Mm. We're sitting in this a scenario here where some of these funds are going back to either other private credit funds to shore up riskier holdings that yeah. might be facing some pressure, or um, you know they call it extend and pretend. It's kind of the moment that we're in right now. Shanali Bassick helping to break down some of the moves that we're seeing in the private markets right now. Let's continue the conversation with someone who knows more about it than almost anyone else. David Golub joining us, president of Golub Capital, who spoke earlier today at the Super Return North America conference, which took place right here in Midtown Manhattan. Great to have you here, sir. Pleasure to be here. I'm sure you overheard some of what uh, Shanali was talking about. And I am curious. I mean, there's risk here, but there's also opportunity. And I'm curious as to what the balance is right now for you. Well, a big surprise to me in 2023 is actually how well private equity and private credit have done. You know, flash back to January of this year, the consensus view was we were going into a recession. In fact, the question wasn't really even if, it was mm -hmm. how deep is it going to be? In February, when we saw the regional bank problems, that drumbeat of negativity got really loud. Here we are in November. Not only didn't we have a recession, we had the reverse. We have an economy that's gaining steam. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there are 
issues in, in credit land. There are always some companies that are under some degree of stress. There's yeah. always a degree of concern that you, you ought to have in the context of rising rates. Mm -hmm. But this year's been a very good year for private credit. I, I am curious. Some of that has also been uh, what's been good for you has largely been because we've seen uh, certain traditional banks, traditional lenders either pull back or at least uh, maybe whittle around the edges and say, we just don't want to do this. There's also the other issue, too, that with some of the uh, I guess debt structures that some of these companies have, they really don't have much choice but to cobble together a much broader universe of uh, lenders. So you're, you're right. There's a phenomenon that's really interesting that's been accelerating over the last couple of years. It really started in 2019. Mm -hmm. In 2019, that was the first year where you saw private credit alternatives for 500 plus million dollar financing needs. Before that, those larger needs were all satisfied in the broadly syndicated bank loan market. Starting in 2019 and really more particularly over the last couple of years, we've seen private credit players club together to create multi-billion dollar financing solutions for private equity backed companies. Mm -hmm. Those solutions didn't used to be an option. And when we were in a position like this year, when the broadly syndicated market's been a bit choppy, the private equity firms didn't have a lot of choices about how to either refinance their businesses or how to expand the, the debt structures for their businesses, now they have another choice. I actually think it's a very healthy phenomenon in the, in the marketplace because you know, having more tools in the toolkit is good for the private equity ecosystem. I want to talk about private equity in relation to private credit because, as we said in the intro, private credit now $1.6 trillion, I believe, private equity, somewhere between 7 and a half to $8 trillion. Are those two asset classes in opposition to each other? When you think about who private credit is taking share from, are they taking share in any way from private equity? I view it as a symbiotic relationship. If you go back 30 years ago, when the private equity industry was just beginning, when there were 10 firms, you know, KKR, Enforcement Little, a couple others, you know, those deals were primarily financed by banks the private credit market didn't really exist. It came to exist as a consequence of a series of regulatory pushes that shoved the banks uh, back into a, into a, a, a position uh, of, of weakness in respect of, of lending to private equity-backed companies. So the private credit market has, since the 1990s, kind of dr grown in a trajectory alongside the growth in the private equity ecosystem. And I think it has a bright future in part because that private equity ecosystem is going to continue to grow. There's mm -hmm. you know, record amounts of private equity dry powder now that's, you know, deal volumes right now are slow, but they're going to they're going to come back. Uh, and, and when they come back, I think you're going to see a, a growing universe of companies that private credit players like Gallup Capital can can finance. And I want to talk about this from the investor perspective as well, because when I see all of these different headlines, so and so raising X billion dollars for their new private credit fund. Who is that coming from? Who are the investors? Are those coming from elsewhere in the private markets? Are you seeing uh, investors in public markets kind of cross over here? I think the big story in recent years has been uh, people, individuals, and institutions shifting capital from traditional fixed income and from traditional uh, public equities into private markets. And um, I think that trend's not over yet. I think you're going to see a continuation of that trend. And I think the principal reason that you're going to see a continuation of that trend is because of the growth of the underlying ecosystem that these private companies represent. If you think about American companies, there are three broad categories. There's public companies, there's family-owned companies, and there's private equity-backed companies. I'd argue that for a whole bunch of structural reasons, you're, you're likely to see continued shrinking of the public equity component and the family-owned component, which means it's going to go one place. It's going to go to the private equity market. I, I'm curious, is there the risk or the worry of too much concentration risk, I guess, within that private capital space. I mean, the idea now that so many people are flocking to it, meaning they have to come to, to, come to you guys uh, for funding, but then they're also looking for funding for other deals that are then being funded by the same backers that funded the original company. So I'm, I'm not that worried about yeah. this issue of concentration. Yeah. If you look at our, our typical funds have portfolios that include positions in 
300 plus different companies. Mm -hmm. So we're big believers in diversification across our funds. Mm -hmm. I think many in our industry are also big believers in diversification. So when you look at the ultimate investor's position, mm -hmm. they're, they're not relying on one bet. All right, David, really uh, enjoyed this conversation. Great to have you on set with us, too. That is David Golub, president of Golub Capital. Now, coming up, we'll speak to another voice from the Super Return North America Conference. Al Rabel, Kane Anderson Capital Advisor CEO, joins us up ahead. Plus, Jamie Dimon has some words of advice for the state of Texas and about how it should maintain its business-friendly reputation. That conversation coming up in a bit. And what do Bumble, Pepsi, and Dish Network all have in common? Stay tuned. We'll bring you the answer. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, U.S. stocks this morning started the week with the bang, but as we get closer to those closing bells, it could go out with a bit of a whimper. Still some bright spots out there, including some big gains in Eli Lilly here on the day. And as far as a Magnificent Seven, well, six of those names are in the green, doing the best that they can to keep this market afloat. But unfortunately, that's not enough. When you look at names like Palo Alto Networks, Tesla, Berkshire Hathaway, and Exxon, all lower here on the day, you get a better sense here of why this market has been struggling at that waterline. That's where the S&P 500 stands right now. Not really much better when it comes to the Nasdaq and the other indices, the Russell 2000. That's your big laggard here on the day. Still some concerns about macroeconomic conditions. A lot of concerns right now about the rate environment here as yields now starting to push a little bit higher after that three-day reprieve that we got towards the end of last week. As far as some of the individual names, you could be thankful that Apple is higher on the day. A big decline that we're seeing in Paramount Global and some interesting idiosyncratic stories that Katie was talking about with DraftKings SoFi as well at Levi Strauss. That is the setup right now as we march closer, Katie, to those closing bells, which are just about 44 minutes away. And before we get there, of course, it's time now for our Muni moment. And last week, Bloomberg had a great interview with Jamie Dimon where he warned that Texas risks undermining its business-friendly reputation with laws designed to punish banks for policies that limit work with the gun and the fossil fuel industries. Bloomberg's Danielle Moran spoke with Dimon, and she joins us now. And to start, first of all, give us an overview of what these Texas laws actually are and why it has Wall Street in such an uproar. Definitely. So in 2021, Texas passed two pieces of legislation that has really impacted my uh, my market, which is the muni bond market. And essentially what their goal was, was to limit business, public contracts with companies that they believe don't adhere to their philosophical values. So it was two pieces of legislation, one which bars any type of public contract over a certain amount with companies that quote, discriminate against the firearms industry. And another piece of legislation that does a very similar type of thing with companies that boycott fossil fuels. This gets to the broader issue, though. We're talking about relatively large banks that obviously have a lot of different interests. And is Diamond sort of making the point that you can't sort of have a, one component of the business sort of be completely separate from the other component of the business? If that is the case, then what is the future for J.P. Morgan in Texas? So Diamond was very clear that they don't discriminate, they don't boycott, they don't halt business relations with any industry just for the purpose of what the industry does. So he said that they don't do either of the things that Texas may suggest that they do do. And they're heavily invested in Texas. They have over 30,000 employees in the state. He made that quite clear. And they have um, a very large presence in the Dallas-Fort Worth er area. Um, and they want to continue that business relationship. That's where I wanted to go. Put Texas in context for us. How important is Texas to the overall muni industry? Texas is a huge part of the muni bond market. This year, it's the largest segment. It has over $52 billion worth of bonding. And that's really because Texas is booming. It has a huge population growth. And that population needs schools. It needs roads. It needs airports. So all of this issuance is coming out of Texas. And that's why it's really important to these banks to continue to, be, to do business there. I'm curious about the flip side of this, meaning the cost to Texas itself. I mean, we just had the list of, I, guess, I think those are all the banks that are under 
view, if you will, to, I think, Wells and RBC have effectively That's been right. told to go kick rocks. <laughs> and if you take out the other eight banks there, I guess the question is who's left? And I don't mean that to be glib or facetious here, right. but I would think you would want more competition because in theory that would lower the costs for the municipal borrowers. But if you've got fewer players, those players are going to have a lot more leverage to basically tell you to take the fee and shove it. Well, that's what's really. And I mean that literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what's really interesting. So, to be clear, Wells and RB RBC haven't been told to kick rocks yet. Okay. They're under review with about um, ten other financial companies um, from the Attorney General's office, and I think that's really at the crux of this argument. If you limit competition, yeah. does it? Was that the same Attorney General that they tried to impeach, or am I thinking of someone different? It's the same one. Okay. Just yep. checking. <laughs> and so there, um, the thesis is that if you limit competition, mm -hmm. it, it raises borrowing costs for governments, and with all of this issuance coming out of Texas, that's of a real concern, especially in this rate environment where borrowing costs is already so high. So you spoke with Jamie Dimon, obviously JP Morgan pushing back against this. Is there any reason to think that Texas will change its stance at all or is this basically set in stone here? Well, this is, these are two laws that were passed. They were passed by the Republican-controlled legislature, and they were signed into law by the governor. Uh, Jamie Dimon's warning to Texas, which was a subtle warning, but one no nonetheless, was that Texas historically has been very business-friendly. They have seen a lot of corporations move there. They have great incentives for corporations. And he said, if you would like to continue that, I urge you not to go down that path. What's the, what's the news, though, when we look at uh, what we read on the Bloomberg terminal earlier about Citigroup uh, basically shutting down or considering shutting down their municipal operations in, in the state there? Is that also directly tied to this or is this something a little bit different? So Citigroup said that that is not directly tied. Mm -hmm. My colleagues on the finance team had a really great scoop out on Friday that talked about how Citigroup is considering cutting its municipal bond business. Citigroup said that that's tied to the profits that the business brings in and isn't related to the Texas part of the equation. That being said, as I mentioned before, Texas is a huge part of the muni bond market. And before Citigroup, um, before these laws went into effect in 2021, Citigroup was the leading manager in Texas. So it obviously had an impact on their margins. All right, Danielle, great piece, great reporting. Really appreciate your time. That is Danielle Moran, who leads Bloomberg's municipal bonds coverage. Much more ahead coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. data collected by Bloomberg Businessweek suggests that highly ranked business schools are seeing a major drop in MBA applications. Programs at most of these schools have actually been falling since 2017. And just digging into the details here, uh, it's interesting. It, at least at, at least 17 of the top 26 programs, they've seen long-term application declines, most of which are continuing into 2023. Uh, yeah. when, why don't people want an MBA? What's going on here? Well, uh, is it that they don't want the MBA, or is it that maybe the, the value proposition isn't just what it used to be? I mean, we should point out that most of the schools on there, I think all of them, really, we can safely say are, with maybe the exception of Texas, uh, uh, Austin, mm -hmm. are pretty expensive, right? Oh, yeah. And so it's funny. We're showing this chart here, but we look. there's also a chart in that story that shows those schools that did actually see an increase in applications over that period, Rochester, University of Rochester, Georgia Tech, USC, Cornell, Vanderbilt, Rice. My guess is that if you looked at the tuition rates on some of those schools, they were probably maybe a little bit more manageable. Yeah. So if you have some concerns about whether there's value to that degree, you, do, you are going to look at the cost. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think about the cost and then you lay it over with the opportunity cost, a full-time program, you're out of the workforce for, what, two years? And of course, you're gaining skills, you're gaining a network, uh, but yeah. does that justify the price tag? It's a real consideration. And also, is, it, is the MBA that, that sort of golden ticket that it used to be? I mean, I'm from the generation where if you wanted to go in business, you weren't going to get a job, or at least you weren't going to elevate yourself up the la corporate ladder unless you had that. And then now we saw with the tech industry kind of upending that, where you, mm -hmm. you got, you know, you have very successful people in the tech industry who never even got an undergraduate degree. And I'm also very aware that I'm talking to a CFA charter holder. That's right. It's comma here. CFA to you. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So of, of why don't they just put letter... that down on my little little Chiron there? Maybe should just I've get been a asking tattoo. for that. You know how hard I work for that thing. I know. You know, I... You get, should get one. No, oh, I got one the day I got my uh, you know my, my results back. There you go. I went down. It says comma CFA. Didn't even need you to go to graduation. This? <laughs> this is the close <laughs> of Bloomberg. <laughs>
This is the countdown to the close. About 30 minutes left to go here, Katie, in the trading day. And it started off, looked like we were headed for some pretty substantial gains. Yeah, no longer. The S&P 500 really bouncing between gains and losses. Right now it's looking at gains, but pretty much unchanged on the day. You take a look at the sector level. It's pretty much an even split here. Up at the top, you do have healthcare up about six tenths of a percent, followed by big tech, the information technology uh, sector up about six tenths of a percent as well. So pretty small gains. Then you go down the list to what's not doing too well. Materials, you have energy down 1%, and then real estate at the bottom, off by about 1.7%, Romaine. Well, one of the few reasons why you actually see the S&P holding into the green right now is because of the Magnificent Seven. Six of those seven stocks have been moving higher on the day, including Microsoft up about eight-tenths of a percent. Tesla is your outlier on the day among that cohort, down a slightly here. A bid coming into AMC and some of the movie stocks here. Another pretty decent weekend here with Killers of the Flower Moon, the latest Martin Scorsese flick, as well as a couple of others, continuing to show that there is an appetite for people to go back and sit in the theater. And we get a lot of earnings this week as well, including after the bell tonight. NXP Semiconductors is on deck. Those shares down about up about three-tenths of a percent here on the day. And you see down at the bottom here, unchanged WeWork. Those shares were halted uh, before uh, the trading day even started here. The anticipation right now that we are expecting to get a bankruptcy filing out of WeWork, a huge fall from Grace Katie Greifeld for a company that looked like at one point to be dominating the real estate market. And as we await of that potentially coming, of course, the Super Return North America is kicking off its two-day event today in New York. And, of course, this is one of the largest private equity events in the country. And joining us right now is one of the keynote speakers. We're talking about Al Rabel. He is CEO of Kane Anderson Capital Advisors. And let's stick with this real estate conversation. I'm looking at your notes. You're talking about dislocation in traditional real estate sectors. As I understand your uh, proposition here, you're not in those traditional sectors. Where is that dislocation translating into opportunity for you? Yeah, that's correct, Katie. We invest in medical office, senior housing, student housing, and class B multifamily. And of course, although the traditional sectors are taking the brunt of it, notably office, um, there you know, nevertheless are impacts on other asset classes as well. We are in an incredibly liquidity constrained environment right now. And I know last time I was on the show, I said I'm in the hard landing camp. I'm still in the hard landing camp, but hard landing or not hard landing, the reality is there's no debt available out there. So we have both a debt and equity business. We're one of the few who has access to capital, both debt and equity in these asset classes, and we've got outsized experience and expertise. And the competitor set in these quote unquote alternative verticals is far smaller than in traditional asset classes. So, you know, one of the one of my sayings is get comfortable being uncomfortable. And, you know, I think that's that's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. As a runner, I particularly like that. But given <laughs> that you have both debt and equity at your disposal, both of those businesses under your roof. What is the best way to take advantage of those opportunities right now? Are you doing that more through debt or through equity? It's a great question. I always say it's not, it's not an either or, it's an and. And I believe that while returns are similar at this point in time on both, I'm talking about for opportunistic transactions, the reality on the equity side is that your, your return on investment or your, your, your total return on capital will be, it'll be longer duration and will be, you know, will be in excess of where you will end up on the debt side. Um, but two specific examples um, that, we've, you know, that we've had lately because we're seeing capitulation happen now. Okay. And this is the first time that we've seen it. And we expect this over the next 24 months to pick up steam. So my view is we're, we're in the early innings here, but we, we just bought a $1.4 billion portfolio of loans, fully performing loans from Synovus Bank, 93% occupied, 106 medical office loans backed by 308 properties, mm -hmm. um, nine-year weighted average lease duration, 62% loan to value, at a material discount to net asset value. So that tells you what kind of illiquidity is out there in the market today. And on the equity side, we're seeing, um, we just bought a five property portfolio at Ohio State University, yeah. close to a 7% going in cap. Um, you would never have seen, that's, 250 basis points wide yeah. of where it would have been 18 months ago. I, I mean, the value is certainly there. I mean, on paper, you could definitely see it. There is a question, though, of uh, how long it takes to sort of get to whatever your required return is here. I mean, what is the waiting period like right now relative to maybe what it was, uh, let's say, prior to the pandemic? 
I don't think in our asset classes the waiting period is different. You're not getting positive leverage, yeah. but the dynamic you have is a demand supply mismatch. Mm. So you have outsized demand with relatively little supply coming online. Yeah. And so, so you've got a demand supply mismatch for a long period of time, and we're mm. seeing double digit rent growth in the verticals in which we invest. Right. So I believe we're closer to the, and I think most people do, yeah. closer to the peak in interest rates than the trough. Right. So you're still looking at a three to seven year time frame. But with regards to the value of those businesses uh, on the commercial side or schools or I think you mentioned senior living as well, uh, the assumption is is that what you're making, what in terms of rents and the other things that go into that, that these are structural changes that are lifting those that meaning they're going to persist, right? Correct. Yeah. That that you've got a demand supply mismatch for as far as the eye can see. I mean, you have yeah. 11,000 Americans turning 65 every day for the next 20 years. You'll yeah. have. 20% of the population will be 65 and older by 2050, and the baby boom generation will all be 65 and older by 2030. So huge demand tailwinds for healthcare. You have the same dynamic on the off-campus student housing mm -hmm. side. So it, it, combine that with a completely illiquid debt environment where basically new construction loans are virtually impossible to attain, mm -hmm. so very limited supply. We're back to 2010 supply levels for, for seniors housing and for off-campus student housing. That, that is a recipe for strong growth in rents. We are going to see investors allocate much more money than they have historically into these asset classes. So when you are looking at selling these assets or when we're looking at selling them three to 10 years from now, it is highly likely that you will have a broader, deeper buyer base than you have today. Well, you mentioned allocators really looking at these asset classes. And the question that I've been asking is, where is that money coming from? Where are you taking money away, or are the allocators taking money away from to invest more heavily in private markets? It's a great question. I don't think it's so much taking money away from. Real estate is an investment asset class that's not going anywhere. So you have large so sovereign government entities, you have large pension plans. Those dollars continue to come in on a global basis. And you've had basically not a complete stoppage, but an 18-month massive downtrend in LP allocations, as you, as you well know. So I think at this point, I've seen a sea change in terms of LP investor sentiment. And LPs are saying to me, and I think to other GPs as well, we get it, 2024 and 2025 are buyer's markets. This is the time, to, you know, this is the time for us to get in. Even though we've suffered some pain over here, we're not going to sit it out anymore. So we're, we're seeing that happen today. All right, Al, it's great to see you again. Hope to chat again soon. That is Al Rabel. He is Kane Anderson, Capital Advisors CEO. Now coming up, a number of shakeups in the C-suite. We'll discuss what's driving the changes next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Down to the close, I'm Katie Greifeld with Romaine Bosick, and joining us now is Scarlet Fu, which is very exciting because we're doing something different today. We're going to take a look at three of the top newsmakers of the day. Today, in particular, we're looking at shakeups in the C-suite. And let's talk about Bumble first. I thought this was a really interesting story. Basically, first up, Whitney Wolfhard. She's stepping down as CEO of Bumble 10 years after founding this company. And shares, actually, after this news came out, fell to their lowest on record, down about 10%. And uh, I don't know about you guys. I've never used Bumble, but I know that this one set itself apart because it was really women-led. Yeah. I'm always intrigued whenever you have a founder leaving a company because I want to know the inside story. Was she pushed up? Was this, you know, she's looking to do something new? It's all unclear. There's lots of drama in there, potentially. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of reporting uh, in the last couple of years about some of the issues going on behind the scenes. And in fairness, I guess she's staying on as a, kind of an executive chairman role. But it, it gets to that broader question, too, of like when these founders finally age mm -hmm. out and not age in terms of the real age but you know at some point you know they're visionaries they're not always the best operational people not saying she wasn't but at some point there has to be a transition and maybe yeah. this is time yeah maybe it's time yeah. and uh you know the, the share price indicates that there is still a lot of nervousness about this transition yeah. um there's another transition taking place and it's at pepsico and disney because longtime pepsico cfo hugh johnson is moving over to disney uh this is fascinating for so many different reasons because the media industry is in turmoil disney of course trying to fend off Nelson Peltz. And by the way, Johnson has experience guiding PepsiCo through its battle with Peltz 
just 10 years ago. And of course, you know, could he potentially be a successor to Bob Iger? Well, that's what I, I mean. Of course, that was where my mind went immediately, <laughs> right? Because, right? I mean, you consider his career at PepsiCo. He was there for a long time. And let's face it, there were a couple people ended up CEO over him, on whether the time was just not right for him. But I'm sure he has to be angling maybe for something bigger. And I don't know if he sees an opportunity here, assuming that Iger is indeed going to make good on his, on his uh, pledge to depart sometime soon. Yeah, and we talked about the share reaction when it came to Bumble. I don't know if you can read too much into this, but you like take a look at Disney shares down about 1.4% today on this news, though. I will point out that if you take a look at uh, PepsiCo shares, they're pretty much unchanged. Yeah, so. PepsiCo, they made clear that they already have someone lined up to take over for Hugh Johnston. I think with regards to the move about whether Johnston could be a next CEO, he's 61 years old. This sounds like a lateral move in that he goes over from PepsiCo to Disney yeah. uh, as CFO, but I have to imagine that there's like room for growth, and that's why he's doing it. All right. Well, you saw the share moves there. Can we take a look at the share move in Dish? Yes. Those shares, last time I looked, were down about 36 uh, percent. And now some of this is based purely on the earnings that they got, uh, which actually weren't good here. But remember, Dish is uh, merging at some point uh, with Echo Star, and they announced who's going to lead the new company. The CEO, Eric Clarson, uh, Carlson uh, will depart November 12th. We learned that from the company here. And Hamid Akhavan, who's going to become president and CEO of the combined company uh, once that deal is actually completed. Now, remember, he's basically president and CEO now of DISH. You know, when I think of Dish and I think of Echo Star, isn't it just Charlie Ergen who runs the show anyway? Uh, well, I was going to, from your lips to God's ears. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but, it does, but, but this gets back to the other issue, too. When you have sort of these really outsized figures, whether they're the founders or yeah. somebody like Bob Iger, who clearly was just a transformational leader here, when does the clock expire on them, right? And, I mean, you can say the same thing about Charlie Ergen. I mean, he's getting up there. He's done a lot of great things here. But at some point, I think investors want to see, if not a passing of the torch, at least to know that there's a succession plan in place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's not a little comfort to shares today when you talk about that amazing decline. But when it comes to the clock, maybe the clock runs out when you uh, report disappointing third quarter revenue and uh, you think about just how poorly this company has fared. Maybe it's time for new leadership. I love succession IRL stories. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's not quite Logan Roy-esque, but, you know, maybe with some prodding it can get there. Maybe uh, with a team of writers, you know, to really amp up the yes. drama. Any story yes. could be succession. And a main character named Shiv. Come on. There you go. <laughs> Are they yeah. Actors still on strike? That's a yeah. great question. I believe so. Yeah, they are. Yeah. All right. But the uh, writers are back, so. Uh, okay, I don't know, writers. All right, a uh, great uh, wrap up here. Uh, take a closer look at Dish, a closer look at Bumble, and of course, a closer look uh, at some of the changes going on over at PepsiCo. Meanwhile, when we come back after the close, I'm told Kitty Greifeld is just going to disappear like a ghost, and Scarlett Foo is going to stick with us here Magic. to take us to the bell and beyond. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here alongside Scarlett Fu, ready to take you to the bell and beyond. And we started off the day, Scarlett. We had a pretty strong rally, but that's clearly faded here. We're basically unchanged on most of the major indices, but the Russell 2000 never really came out of the barn. And I was just looking at the Bloomberg terminal. Elena Popina had a great stat here. This mm -hmm. is now 501 days, assuming that it closes in the red today, 501 days since the Russell 2000 last hit uh, all-time high. Oh, that's pretty ugly if you yeah. think about it. I mean, what's notable is that stocks have not reversed last week's big rally, even mm -hmm. though we start off out of the gate, you know, kind of building on last week's gains. The fact that as bond yields climb, they're still kind of holding up uh, fairly well. But yeah, the la Russell last week rose 7.6 percent, the best week in more than two years. Mm -hmm. You would have thought that maybe people saw value in those small cap stocks. But yeah. with yields moving higher again, they're more sensitive to rising rates. and They're more sensitive, certainly, to a slowing economy. More sensitive and also raises a question as to who's in this market and who's buying it. I mean, we know this has really become a trader's market mm -hmm. and that's driving a lot of things. And I want a lot of things. And I wonder if longer term investors are finding any value uh, in some of those names. It doesn't look like it. I mean, I look at the Russell 2000 and the different industry groups, energy, real estate, health care. Um, they're leading the way down each off by at least 2%. Uh, financials, which we know the Russell 2000 is heavily geared towards, among the biggest decliners in the S&P 500 as well. 
All right, we are about just about uh, eight, nine minutes away from those closing bells. Let's get to uh, our next guest, uh, Charles Lemonides, ValueWorks founder and CIO, joining us right here uh, on set in Studio Two, one of the smartest guys we know, and of course the best beard uh, on Wall Street. Uh, I, I am curious about the moves that we've seen. I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier, Mike Wilson over Morgan Stanley basically saying last week's rally was just a bear market rally, no fundamentals, no technicals to support it. Marco Kalanovich over at JP Morgan said, this is as good as it gets here. Do you see any legs at all to that big rally that we had last week? Yeah, I'm not sure that I do. I think I might be more in their camp. You know, the, the, the point of the Russell uh, being down for, you know, 500 days. Look, the yeah. S&P um, is down 10% or something from its high of almost 18 months ago. This has been a big decline, and it's been an extended decline. And, yeah, we had a big bounce in the NASDAQ names earlier this year. But the Fed's draining liquidity, and there was a lot of money in the system two years ago. And they're working to lower asset values and take money out of the system, and it's having an impact in financial assets. This gets to, to the point, though, that if you do believe the Fed is done or near done, that we're not going to start to see meaningful changes in rates here. Does that change the value proposition, even if they stay elevated? I, I think the point is that you know, if rates stay elevated, then we're still in a restrictive mode when it comes to, to Fed policy. I think while they may not raise Fed funds and, and maybe Treasury's you know, 10 years stays at four and a half or five or five and a quarter or four and a quarter, the, the decade of very, very easy money is over. Mm -hmm. And that's being felt in, in the markets. And I don't think that there's a reason for the Fed to change course particularly dramatically anytime soon. Look, we added 170,000 jobs last month. Yeah, that's less than 300,000, but we added 170,000 mm -hmm. jobs. There's no reason for them to, to turn around and start pumping money out there. Mm -hmm. Inflation's still high. Um, so I think while the rate tightening might be over, the tightness in monetary policy, I, I think, is has got a way to go. So you're saying investors are getting ahead of themselves, way ahead of themselves in terms of pricing an a possible rate cut for next summer. Well, listen, if you're pricing in a rate cut for next summer, sure, you're betting on that. And, you know, we had a big bounce in the markets last week. You're right. It was a big bounce. It was also a bigger bounce in the names that were most depressed and had sold off the most. And those names may have come down to attractive prices, but, you know, when you get major sell-offs, which maybe we're in the middle of one, you know, those things don't stop at, like, fair prices. They stop at really, really, really cheap prices. And the markets are not really, really cheap by any measure right now. They're not expensive, mm -hmm. but we haven't gotten to the place where they're just giving you stocks for free. Right, not enough for people to really come in and decide now's the time. So when you look at yields, why is everyone convinced that we have seen the peak in yields? Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Look, you know, you had a bounce after a, a brutal sell-off. You know, that could have been the bottom last week. Sure, it could have been. And look, markets discount six months ahead, they say, right? And Maybe the, the economy is turning around six months from now, and maybe this was the bottom in the markets. But maybe it wasn't. And I don't know, just because they had a bounce doesn't mean, you know, there was a complete capitulation and, and this is the ultimate bottom. I mean, it could be, but I don't think there's, I don't think you've got a leg to stand on to say, yeah, that was, that was totally it. I'm curious, though, I mean, as a value investor, I mean, where do you find value right now, particularly if you believe that this volatility is here to stay for a little bit longer? Well, look, the key thing about investing is not investing for the next three months or six months, but for the next year and two years. And there are a lot of individual securities that a year from now and two years from now are going to be much higher priced than they are today. Um, I do think you want to be careful. I do think you don't want to get ahead of yourself. You know, we're lucky enough to have a long and a short book. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have a lot of short names in the, in the portfolio today. Um, and I think you can be security specific, but, you know, that, that involves work and discernment. So if you have a short book as well, how much do you think these powerful rallies are going to be driven by short covering? They'll, they'll be intense and then they'll kind of fade away. You know, that's, you know, the, the rally we saw last week is pretty consistent with what technically a short covering rally looks like and, and a bear market trap looks like, mm. you know, and, and, you know, they say that bull markets are characterized by uh, long, steady advances interrupted by sharp, steep sell-offs, and that bear markets are characterized by long, grinding declines interrupted yeah. by sharp rallies. And if that wasn't a sharp rally, you know, 
I don't know what was. I am curious that when you talk about the short uh, book and your long book here, I mean, how many of those names on the short book were once in your long book and vice versa? Great question. You know what? We definitely have had names that, that have gone from one to the other. Um, it's unusual because we don't like to, to um, short great growth stories mm -hmm. and we don't like to buy value traps. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not just about valuation, but you know, sometimes the, the fundamental story changes and sometimes our opinion on the story changes. Mm -hmm. uh, more than that, there are a lot of names in our short book today that have been investor darlings in the past. Mm -hmm. And we think that they were investor darlings mostly on fluff and hype. Mm -hmm. And the darling aspect of them has, has left the stocks. Um, and, and so, you know, you no longer have the, the great story and the, the investor love, and you don't have the basic business either. And th those are great short names for us. Are narratives still driving this market, though? You know, less so, I think, today yeah. than they were, mm -hmm. you know, recently. Look, the big narrative that's driving it is liquidity going to place to, to, to safe havens, generally. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the Fabulous Seven, yeah. you know, have been the Fabulous Seven because mm -hmm. they're the safest, the perceived safest place to put your money. Yeah. And it's, yeah, there are a couple of individual stories out there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I don't see that much there. All right, Charles, going to have to leave it there. Always great to have you here uh, on set. Uh, Charles Lemonides there, ValueWorks founder and CIO, helping us count down uh, to those closing bells, which are just about uh, two minutes away. And as we move closer to those closing bells, you don't want to go anywhere. Our full market coverage starts right here on Bloomberg as we take it to the Bell and Beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. Joined now by our friends Paul Sweeney as well as Molly Smith. We welcome our audiences across Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio, as well uh, as our partnership with YouTube. I think we're having some technical difficulties with them, Scarlett. We'll okay, connect with I'm them good. in just a minute here. But, I mean, you talk about this idea that we're good old kind of switch. through a big chunk of earnings season right mm -hmm, now, right? Mm -hmm. That's over. So what's the catalyst? The Fed's over. There's no economic data this speak. week. There's a lot oh, of Fed speak. Oh, you're into the Fed speak. <laughs> I am when we need a catalyst, and Jay Powell will be speaking later on this mm -hmm. week. But yeah, we've got a lot of data points to fill in before the next Fed decision. So it, it, it's true. We're looking for catalysts, and the catalyst at this point, as it's been for the last couple of weeks, is bond yields. Yeah. Well, that, well, well, I'm glad you brought that up, though. But, I mean, does this just continue to sort of drive the volatility yeah. that if bond yields are up, then that means stocks are going to have to go down? That's the correlation we're talking about now? Well, except it's not really happening today either. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to, to pin it down. I think what's really fascinating, I love the question that you posed to Charles Lemonides, which was, are narratives still driving this market? I, mm. I feel like we've been searching for a narrative. We've been yeah. looking for one. And when we can't find one, people are too eager to impose one on the market. Yeah, well, certainly so, and that's like, the problem. Like, for instance, right yields now. have peaked, right? This idea, I mean, there's nothing, there's yields nothing reasonably that points out that yields have peaked, except that we wanted them to peak because it's a good talking point. All right, I think we have our radio colleagues now tapped in here to their microphones here, and I'm curious, Paul, here, what you thought uh, of some of the price action today? Yeah, it's interesting. It's just, I was just asking a couple of our guests earlier. Just it was such a busy week last week, both in terms of the bond market and then how the equity markets just followed the bond market, and so it just seems like today was just a calmer day. Everybody. Just just kind of reassessing where we are after last week's big moves. That's what it felt like. Yeah, of course, coming off what was, of course, uh, the best week, at least for some of the major indices all year long. Not so much today here. You did have all of the major indices open higher on the day, but it looked like almost all of them spent a significant time in the red. The net effect of it all is basically unchanged on the day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average higher by a tenth of a percent, right around that 34,000 level. The S&P 500 up two tenths of a percent below that 4,400 level. The Nasdaq Composite up about three tenths of a percent, right now camped out at 13,500 and change. And the Russell 2000 never really got any traction all day long off the lows of the day, but still lower on the day by about 1.3%. And when you look at market breadth, it's uh, definitely to the downside. You have 344 stocks lower for every uh, four, 158 stocks higher in the S&P 500. Looking at the industry groups, uh, pretty evenly balanced as well. Tech, hardware, pharma, and household and personal products leading the gains there. And on the downside, REITs, energy, and diversified financials all lower by at least eight-tenths of one percent. 
All right, some, definitely some gainers out there today in the marketplace. First, Constellation Energy, this utility is higher uh, after better than expected results. They also had EBITDA taking their guidance up on EBITDA. So for a company that pays dividends, EBITDA is important. Eli Lilly, chief scientific officer, said he is uh, extremely optimistic that a major Alzheimer's breakthrough drug is coming in Bloomberg's own San Fazelli, I believe was at that meeting up in Boston. Uh, bookings, booking holdings higher as an analyst at DA Davidson uh, upgrades the stock to a buy. So I guess people are still out there traveling. Going to kick it off here on the decliners then on the flip side of all of that with Dish. This is a rough oh, day boy. for Dish. Oof. Oh, boy, is right, Paul. Yeah, worst stock decline on record for Dish today after reporting a disappointing third quarter revenue and drop in wireless customers. That was a lot worse than what analysts predicted. We're talking five. They lost five times as many mobile mm. customers yep. as what analysts had set out. So Dish uh, now had the shares were down 37 percent. A record one day drop. And we Not should point so. out Echo Star, which they're merging with, was also down 30% here on the day. Yeah, guys, I, f I follow Charlie Ergen's companies for 30 years, and he was just money. But he's the last seven, eight, nine years, he's made this bet on Spectrum, and it has been the wrong bet. Mm. Very painful to watch that one today. Uh, shifting over to then Paramount Global, um, another one that did not have a great day today. This one uh, was a uh, slide of down, uh, ended the day down around $12 after um, B of A, and this was a, an analyst that you know well, Paul. Jessica um, Reef. Yep. Right, yeah, one of the biggest uh, media analysts in the industry that she cut Paramount Global down to underperform from buy. That's a double downgrade. Ooh. See, it doesn't see a good pipeline there for Apple. Asset sales. Last one I was looking at well, today. And I, and I just want to point out, too, I mean, she was very specific, though. I mean, she kind of singled out BET and Showtime yep. and really just asked yeah. the question as to why. And she seemed to imply that there have been offers on the table. I don't know if we ever got official confirmation from Paramount. But if that is the case, it does raise the question as to what they saw and why they thought, felt they had to pass. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm not sure that we had that as well, but I also got that impression. It was a bit vague as to what exactly isn't she seeing? What did you know <laughs> Paramount possibly pass up on? That um, I don't know. Maybe a little bit of uh, some knowledge there that she's privy to that maybe the rest of us aren't. Um, and the last one that I was looking at on the decliners today, this is Solar Edge. Uh, it's gotten a lot of downgrades lately. Wells Fargo, the latest of which um, on the solar equipment supplier in the wake of a re weak revenue forecast last week. So um, one of the biggest percentage decliners in the S&P 500 today. Let's take a look at the yield space course because that drove a lot of the broader market price action yields higher all across the board here on this Monday afternoon. Coming across, of course, we talk about the big week that stocks had. We should point out last week, was also a big week for Treasuries, uh, at least for the benchmark 10-year yield. That was the best uh, performance on a price basis that we had seen, I believe, going back uh, to March uh, of this year. But that is now uh, being sort of clawed back in a pretty big way, nine basis points lower on the two-year, about eight basis points lower on the 10-year here. And, of course, a lot of concerns right now, guys, about Treasury supply. Another busy week uh, for auctions. Of course, we have a three-year, a 10-year, and a 30-year auction all taking place over the span of the next three trading days. All right, we also have some earnings. It's, uh, as we've been talking about, most of the big earnings have come out, but we do have numbers out of TripAdvisor. And the third quarter numbers do beat analyst estimates, whether you're looking at revenue or the bottom line. Revenue of $533 million, uh, by, better than the expected $505 million that analysts were anticipating. It also was an increase of 16% from a year ago. Yeah. Adjusted EPS of $0.52 cents also beats the consensus estimate as well by $0.06. Cents. Uh, analysts were looking for $0.46. Cents. So TripAdvisor right now up about 3% you know in first trading. You know what I thought? It was interesting. There was an interesting upgrade earlier today uh, on booking, uh, mm -hmm. uh, dot com, uh, booking a holdings. Yeah, Paul mentioned uh, And the analyst over there, D over at DA Davidson, was talking about this idea of discretionary spend and how, yes, overall it may be going down, but in his, at least in, in their view, the idea was that we were going to see more of that spend to travel, that that was going to be, uh, they were going to sacrifice other discretionary items, other discretionary services in favor of continuing to travel. I mean, you've got to then, uh, from the econ economic lens, because that's, of course, the way that I'm going to look at this, and see, you know, if TripAdvisor's up and we're looking at what's, you know, pretty good outlook for them, and I'm hearing all these reports of that the consumer is about to have its worst fourth quarter, kind of hard to square those two, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to be looking at the retail sales uh, coming out up uh, shortly, as well as <laughs> earnings from the retailers coming up. They're always kind of the tail end of the earnings cycle, but that'll give us a good sense of where this consumer is.
Well, and it gets to also to the point, too, the idea that if there is sort of material softness here, when does that start to trickle into some of those uh, sectors that I think had held up uh, pretty well here, whether we're talking about consumer travel or some of the other uh, services uh, that we talk a lot about on this show, Scarlett? I mean, what's the breaking point? Yeah, well, I mean, I think when you, you get to retail and especially apparel companies, that's where the rubber meets the road, uh, whether people are going to continue spending on items that have only gotten more expensive given labor costs, given material costs, given shipping costs. I know. I mean, here we are, folks. It is November. It is holiday shopping season. So, I mean, I want to really hear from the retailers about what they think of, about this holiday season, because as we all know, that makes or break uh, the year for most of these retailers. Yeah, and so far, Paul, the outlook has not been that great. Um, we were looking at the biggest U.S. toy makers not too long ago yeah. in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, those really bad outlooks coming out of Mattel and Hasbro. And yeah. the hiring, too, that we've seen um, in the job space of things, that the seasonal hiring announcements really slow so far this Good year. Point. So that's also not adding to such a festive mood going into the fourth quarter. Yeah, sorry. I mean, we're talking about retail, I guess, to some extent. I just saw this cross the wire here. This is on Overstock or Bed Bath & Beyond, whatever we're calling it right now here. We had learned earlier in the day that they appointed a new interim CEO and president. Now uh, we're learning from the company here that they, the board had asked Jonathan Johnson to step down as hmm. chief executive officer. Now it doesn't exactly say why here, uh, but an interesting uh, uh, moves. We were just talking a little bit earlier on the TV program with Scarlett and Katie about some of the C-suite changes, whether it's over uh, at Pepsi and Disney or uh, over at, uh, what is it, Bumble, mm -hmm. uh, which I know you're a big fan of, Paul. Sure. And, uh, and then <laughs> even over there at, uh, at Dish uh, with, the, you mentioned Charlie Ergen, but of course, uh, this new tie up with Echo Star, uh, they've sort of just picked, I guess, the current president and CEO over at Dish uh, to helm that combined company. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one. I mean, it's a Charlie Ergen play. That, 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 that's what investors are betting on, but uh, it, there's a lot to prove there. Yeah, all right. How much room does the whoever's taking over have to do anything when Charlie Ergen's kind of overseeing exactly. the entire enterprise, right? Exactly. And investors are just, you know, betting on Charlie, listen to Charlie's every word. Um, and so far, he has not been able to monetize all that spectrum he bought over the last six, seven, eight years. And that's a real problem. All right. Always great to have uh, Paul Sweeney on with that uh, type of uh, knowledge there. And our thanks to Molly Smith. That does it for our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg Television, Radio, and YouTube. And a reminder. Bloomberg Business Week is now on Bloomberg Originals. We'll be back with uh, Paul and the rest of the gang there in our radio studio, same time, same place. Meanwhile, we continue our coverage here on Bloomberg Television to focus on the economy after the break with Constance Hunter, Senior Advisor for Macro Policy Perspectives. This is a close on Bloomberg. Here in U.S. financial markets, we started the morning here with a pretty strong rally that faded pretty quickly as we got closer to those closing bells. The net effect of it was relatively unchanged for most of the major indices with the Dow, the NASDAQ, uh, and uh, the uh, S&P 500 fractionally higher here on the day, two-tenths of a percent for the S&P. But as you see behind me here, the Russell once again was a big laggard. 501 days now since it last hit a record high, causing a lot of concerns here about whether some of the key technical levels that people look at are reliable measures of where we go next. Apple had a relatively good day, and Constellation Energy, that was actually one of your big outperformers here on the day, a utility. Good earnings there, and I guess for some people, a modicum of safety. Meanwhile, the 10-year yield as well as the entire yield curve shifting you know, just a little bit higher here after, of course, that three-week uh, rally that we saw last week that had pushed yields higher by about 36 basis points just over that three-day stretch. No real action on the dollar today and the crude oil a little bit higher here in the new session as we move into Tuesday. But before we get there here, there is a lot of talk here about economic conditions and a lot of talks right now about credit standards. We did get the senior loan officer survey out of the Fed a little bit earlier. And it was kind of interesting. We had those comments out of Rafael Bostic last week who basically said he's seen a tightening of credit conditions and he expected them to tighten further. That didn't actually show up in the data itself. In fact, it kind of stood pat from where we were the previous quarter. But as the chart behind me shows, you are seeing some modicum of tightening here, though we're not nearly near at the extremes that we were back in 2022. Scarlett. All right. We'll, of course, dig into that SLU's report in a little bit. But I do want to bring you some breaking news out of NXP Semiconductor uh, reporting third quarter EPS and 
revenue that beat analyst estimates. As for the outlook, the chipmaker, uh, which of course is based in the Netherlands, says it sees a fourth quarter adjusted EPS of 344 to 386. The midpoint of that would be $3.65, which is higher than the consensus estimate of $3.61. As for fourth quarter revenue, uh, the top line, 3.3 billion to 3.5 billion, that is the range. The midpoint of that is somewhat lower than the consensus estimate of $3.42 billion. Uh, we've seen chip makers really uh, get a little bit of a reprieve uh, this earnings season, Intel, AMD, and you're looking at NXP semiconductors currently up about 2% in after hours trading. All right, let's get back to that SLU's report that you were talking about, Romain, and bring in Constance Hunter, Senior Advisor for Macro Policy Perspectives. Constance is the former Chief Economist for KPMG and former NABE President as well. Great to see you in Good our studios. You. Yeah, great to be here. So Romain was telling us about the SLU's report and how there's nuance there because although standards are tightening and although demand uh, for consumer loans is falling, it's not as tight as maybe some people had anticipated. What does that tell you? So it's not as tight as it was the last time they did the survey, which is great, especially when you consider other aspects of financial conditions have gotten tighter, such as interest rates, right? And so it means banks are a little more comfortable lending, the landscape looks a little better, it's moving in the right direction, but we're still at levels which suggest if we look down the road three, six months from now, we would expect the unemployment rate to be higher, right? So it's more data that tells us, yes, it's improving slightly, but from a pretty constricted level. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, we're still looking at conditions that suggest this is the Fed, last Fed's rate hike is in, and we're probably going to be seeing cuts in 2024. So you we're talking about unemployment rates starting to rise, what, in January and February and really kind of hitting its stride by the summer? Something like that, yes. I mean, that's the timing is very hard to pinpoint exactly, right? But if, but if you look at the latest jobs report, mm -hmm. we do bottom up analysis of what companies are saying in their earnings report, which suggests slowed hiring, increased layoffs, right? Then you combine this with the senior loan office survey. The level, even though it's slightly improved, suggests that we should be more in an employment rate close to four. 4.1 percent, right? When will we get there? It's difficult to say, right? But but the fact we were pro are we probably going to be there by the second half of next year? Yes, and all this is going to corroborate to slow demand mm -hmm. and continue reinforcing the slowing inflation story. So the only hope we have here is to have increasing productivity, which of course we saw in last week's data. We did. What's driving that though? Because I mean, productivity, or at least that increase, the meaningful increase, has been somewhat elusive. And I mentioned the interview that Mike McKee had with Raphael Bostic last week, uh, where he did talk a lot about uh, improvements that he's seen on the productivity space. Yeah, so I mean, we saw, this is the first uh, coming out of a, a recession where we've really seen a significant amount of capex, right? So coming out of the COVID recession, we saw two things bounce back in ways that we we don't normally see after recessions. Of course, the first one is jobs. Now we had an outsized fall, we shut the economy, we opened it, jobs came back at an extraordinarily fast rate. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that happened, which is unique, is that you saw capex really um, rebound almost immediately, right? Um, and so that capex has a shelf life. Right, it, it, it has a half-life, so to speak, right? And so it's going to keep delivering dividends in terms of productivity that that investment has created. Is this going to be broad-based, though? Because when I hear CapEx and I look at the last earnings season, or at least what we've gotten so far through this earnings season, there's still a lot of those big cap names that are making these announcements, showing that they're still willing to spend. Are we going to see that in, I guess, sort of the mid-cap level and even the small-cap level? Yeah, that's a that's a great yeah. question. This this question of how, how dispersed mm -hmm. is the is the productivity enhancement. So I have a couple data points to point mm -hmm. out you. First is that um, we've seen business formations and high propensity business formations, which rose really significantly after the pandemic, stay at very highly elevated levels. So these are levels that we haven't seen since before the global financial crisis, and they've been sustained. New businesses are historically likely to adopt the newest technologies as they get started, right? And these businesses are not large businesses, they're small businesses. Uh -huh. Um, we also know that, that um, to sort of address your point, when you have restrained access to capital, whether it's through bank lending or other forms of capital markets, you do have less investment and that impacts the productivity story. Um, so, so there's a lot of cross currents. I would say one thing about AI that is really different from past sort of uh, productivity enhancing technology, it tends to be accretive very, very quickly. 
And because of that, companies are able to make investments where the ROI is not only significant, but soon. Right, mm -hmm. that soon and significant ROI really helps investment continue, and you're not talking about big dollars. But is that a one-off, though? Like, can that continue going forward in quarters to come, or do they have to keep spending to get that that return? No, actually, because the ROI is high, right? So because you have greater efficiency. If you think about just let's take Salesforce, right, which uses a huge amount of AI all the companies that are clients of Salesforce then deploy that AI in a way that's customized for their business. They become more efficient in how they go to market, which leads to higher sales or more efficient use of resources to obtain sales. That's a flywheel that's just a positive growth story. Is that going to be the main growth story? Is there, going to be, is there anything else out there that maybe gets paired with that? Oh, sure. I mean, if you think about um, what's happening with R&D and specifically medical R&D, right, and the story of how we got the COVID vaccine so quickly, it's because we were able to deploy AI to, to crunch through reams and reams of data. Um, and it's how we got to say, hey, maybe the RNA technology could be applied to this. And it's how we got the vaccine so quickly. So I think you're going to see um, a huge um, benefit to pharmaceuticals and biotech. All right, Constance, this was great. Great to have you here in studio. Great to have you back. Constance Hunter over at Macro Policy Perspectives here, a look at some of the potential catalysts here for our economy. Coming up here, we're going to take a look at some of the distortions that we're seeing in the S&P 500 and why this year's lopsided rally has made it harder for the S&P to maintain its point of distinction. That conversation after the break. This is Bloomberg. It's DC FinTech Week and Bloomberg is on site. Live from Washington, Kaylee Lyon speaks with Grayscale CEO Michael Sun and China and others. Tune in for a special one hour episode of Bloomberg Crypto. Bloomberg, context changes everything. Welcome back. Almost one out of every five companies in the S&P 500 fails to meet the $14.5 billion size threshold set for new members. In fact, 35 companies in the mid-cap gauge are larger than the smallest 50 members of the larger cap S&P 500. A reason for that distortion is this year's lopsided equity rally, which has pushed big tech higher while punishing almost everything else. Emily Grafeo joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this story. And Emily, we've kind of seen this coming, right? I mean, this is the idea that a lot of these stocks have declined in value here, yet they're still lingering in the S&P 500. How long do they linger below that threshold before somebody over at S&P Global says, you got to go? They can actually linger in there for quite yeah. some time, Romaine, mm -hmm. because the S&P actually doesn't have a set date like the Russell does, where they actually add or subtract um, different constituents. So they usually just leave it up to M&A, and we haven't really had a lot of M&A this year. Yeah. If there's an IPO or a spinoff and a company gets added or deleted, so we actually have a pretty stagnant S&P 500. But right it now. raises a question as to how representative the S&P 500 is. Uh, I mean, part of the beauty of it was it was 500 companies. It's relatively diversified. We always make fun of the Dow Jones Industrial Average because it's 30 stocks and how representative that can that be. But if, you know, a dozen stocks are basically leading the charge for the S&P 500, isn't that just as distorted? Yeah, I mean, it's a story that we've kind of been talking about all year. The Magnificent 7, 7 has rallied so much. And when you look at the equal weighted S&P 500, it mm. really hasn't budged that much this year. So I would say that this distortion in the index is really just another example of how much power big tech has had over the rest of the index. And then you look at the mid cap and there actually are a decent a handful of companies that are a lot larger than those small ones that are lingering at the bottom of the S&P 500. So that begs the question, why doesn't Dow Jones, which of course compiles the S&P 500, why doesn't it do anything about this? Why does it wait for M&A before it does anything? They really want to avoid turnover. So they declined to comment on this story, but they pointed me to their method methodology uh, document where they go through um, how the indexes are created. And so turnover adds a lot of fees. It adds headaches for any fund managers who are trying to mirror the index and their strategies. So they try to avoid the turnover as much as possible. Mm. They really don't add and subtract a lot of companies like other indexes do. And I think they're also just not that worried, even though one-fifth is uh, twice the average of companies that usually <laughs> fall below the market cap threshold, according to Bloomberg Intelligence. They really think that uh, the market will probably like 
even itself out and the eventually the distortion will things will smooth. revert to the mean in things will revert to the mean exactly so it's interesting because you could argue that the S&P 500 is the world's biggest passive index fund except that it doesn't follow these rules because there's active decision making here in terms of not kicking out companies that have fallen below the threshold that's right yeah there's a number of sources that I speak to Eric Belchunas of Bloomberg Intelligence he's one of them they have this theory that actually um, these passive indexes are not as passive as you might think because like you said, there are a lot of people um, and they're very like tight-lipped about their decisions, mm -hmm. but they're people making decisions as to what should go into the index. I will say, when you look at the overall market cap of the S&P 500, it's much larger than the mid cap. It's much, yeah. small, it's much larger than the small cap, but the actual names in the companies at the borders of each um, are kind of... I guess mismatch. But I'm curious though too. I mean, I was just going, we showed some of the names on the screen and some of these are pretty consequential companies, at least in terms of what's in the Gazite guys. And we were talking earlier about Paramount, you got Hasbro, uh, you have a lot of uh, retailers, you have airlines in there, solar companies. I mean, it's a pretty good cross section of stuff here that is below that uh, 14 and a half billion dollar threshold and a few tech companies in there as well. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the companies at the bottom have fallen a lot. I think Sealed Air Corp was the one that I mentioned in my story. It's down yeah. like 30%. I love this company's date. name because it literally makes sealed air. <laughs> yeah, I don't really, yeah. I'm not sure what that is. It's, really. it's, no, it's like the bubble. bubble <laughs> oh, right, right, right. I did know that. I air that sealed. Right. Sealed air. Don't exactly. overthink it, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the name of the company is just that, what it does. Now, really now tell me what, what Mohawk is. Industries does. Is that, that flooring or something? <laughs> I think it's fascinating also that so many mid cap companies or companies in the mid cap index are actually big cap stocks because we never talk about mid cap stocks, mm -hmm. right? We talk about the S&P 500 and we talk about the Russell 2000 and the mid caps just get ignored completely. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a number of ETFs that track the mid cap indexes. To, to be completely honest, though, I really don't meet a lot of portfolio managers exactly. who specialize in mid cap. It's usually small and large. So maybe this index reshuffling more people will look at the mid cap now because there's actually some companies that there's are arbitrage fairly large. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Interactive Brokers is in the mid cap index and they're above 30 billion. So a lot larger mm -hmm. than a lot of the smallest names in the S&P 500. And Scarlett's favorite, Decker's Outdoor. Uh, yes. Just above that as well. Emily Grafeo, a great Sales story. Sales rose like 27% last quarter. A great Bad. story on the Bloomberg Terminal out of Emily today that really kind of takes a look here at some of the, I guess, I don't know, call them fallen angels, if you will, in the S&P 500. Meanwhile, we're going to take a closer look at what's going on with uh, consumer spending and snacking. We're going to speak with Dirk Vandeput, the CEO and chairman over at Mondelez, on the back of their latest earnings report. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. I want some chocolate. <laughs> Another volatile day in financial markets here in the U.S. What started off, it looked like an extension of the equity rally that we had from last week, gave way here to a bit of selling as we move closer to those closing bells. The S&P, the Dow, as well as the Nasdaq did manage to close in the green, but only fractionally higher here on the day, while the Russell 2000 was the big lagger, down more than a percent. Still some persistent concerns here about the cyclical trade, still some persistent concerns here about the economy. You see the move in yields here, down uh, across the board, up, excuse me, across the board, eight tenths, eight basis points on the 10-year yield. Meanwhile, not a low lot of action today in the VIX and the dollar, the cross-asset story right there on your screen on a week here where we're getting a little bit of reprieve from earnings. Most of the big names are out of the way, but still a few others left out there. Yeah, but the big story out of earnings so far has been concern about what spending looks like going forward, what demand looks like going forward. We heard from snack giant Mondelez International last week. It reported results that did beat analyst estimates. Here now just to refresh us and give us a recap is our Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? Well, Scarlett, it was a very strong quarter. They beat both uh, adjusted earnings and sales estimates. And demand for snacks, it was strong. You can see that beat, they beat uh, EPS estimates by 4%. That was uh, putting up $0.82 cents on not a little bit more than $9 billion, which was a 2% beat. So again, beating Wall Street consensus estimates, volume growth was strong, outpacing some of the peers. And what was really interesting to me is the commentary is that the demand for snacks, uh, it remains really pretty robust, even with higher prices. And who could resist one of these uh, giant Oreos? I wish I was eating sugar right now because I would certainly uh, have one for sure. Now, it's interesting because on the year, it's been a choppy ride for Mondelez. You can see up into uh, 
uh, this spring, similar to some of uh, the other stocks and companies out there, falling a little bit earlier. But this recent rebound having to do with the markets more broadly, but also with, uh, in fact, this strong quarter. And it the pricing power that they're talking about, they are with the demand that they're seeing for snacks. Some are saying that chocolate and cookies seen as uh, an affordable indulgence. They've maintained pricing power. But I think the big question on a lot of people's minds, and certainly on my mind, uh, is so here on top we have Nor Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly with their weight loss uh, drugs that are apparently causing people to want to eat less and snack less. On bottom, you can see we do have Mondelez higher on the year. PepsiCo, not so much, though. I think it's down about 10% on the year. So one question is, Will those drugs actually eat into snacking demand? I think right now the answer is no. All right, well, let's uh, get some insights out of someone who would know directly. Dirk Vandeput joining us right now. He's the CEO and chairman over at Mondelez. And, uh, Dirk, I'll just start off uh, with that question that Abigail was asking. I'm not sure if you, can, if you heard it, but, of course, uh, everyone wants to know about the potential impact of these weight loss drugs on uh, some of the snack foods that, uh, of course, are your bread and butter. Yes, um, that's a valid question, I would say. And from our perspective, we've been uh, studying this uh, quite a bit. Um, I would say short term, we see no effect whatsoever. And even long term, assuming relatively high adoption rates of the new drugs, um, looking 10 years out, we think it's going to have maybe half a percent, maybe one percent of effect on the volume that we will have 10 years down the road. So very t limited impact, even at levels of 7 to 14 percent of the U.S. population being on these drugs, which still remains to be seen if that is ever going to be the case. It's a very big if, to my opinion. So uh, I think the whole thing has been a little bit overblown. Mm -hmm. um, and even if the period is 10 years, we will have time to adapt to launch a much more balanced portfolio, uh, shift to healthier items if there would be a, a, an important effect. But at this stage, we yeah. do not believe that that's going to be the case. Yeah, and we should point out for our viewers, of course, everyone knows you guys are for Oreos and other things like that. But, of course, you always have some other uh, healthy options out there like Cliff Bars and a few other things as well. I am curious about overall uh, how consumer demand is holding up for these products overall, given that we've had at least anecdotal evidence of certain consumers pulling back uh, from some of the, I guess, the discretionary items on the grocery shelves. Uh, what has been the effect on your brand specifically, uh, given that trend? Yeah, I would look at volume trends here versus uh, uh, revenue trends because there's been a lot of pricing. So the categories we're in, which is biscuits, chocolate, and baked snacks are flat uh, globally volume-wise, which is pretty good compared to some of the other food items you were talking about. And then if you look at us, Mondelez, we are up, uh, this quarter we were up almost 4% in volume mix. That is driven by the fact that uh, we've been supporting our brands quite extensively. They're loved by the consumers. They don't really want to shift to any other items. And so that is a reflection of the high demand, the strong demand that we're seeing from the consumer so far. A lot of the snacks you mentioned that Romain mentioned have chocolate in them. What are you doing to cope with cocoa prices at 44-year highs? Well, we, we, of course, will have to increase our prices uh, next year because the cocoa prices are almost 80% higher than they were a year ago. So there's really no other way than to, to apply a price increase. Mm -hmm. uh, now, cocoa goes up and down, and so I wouldn't uh, look too much for the long term into that. But uh, short term, yes, we, we see that inflation also on sugar, by the way. And so while the rest of our input cost is largely flat for next year, uh, those two are, are really causing us to have to increase prices again. Can you talk a little bit about the decision to increase prices versus maybe shrinking the size of the packaging, shrinking what each unit looks like? I mean, shrinkflation has been something that we've seen in the past. Um, to what extent is that an option in coping with higher cocoa, higher sugar prices? Yeah, so we use uh, this methodology called RGM, Revenue Growth Management, which is four key things. It's pri straightforward pricing. It is playing around with the size of the packs. It's also how much and how high you run your promotions. And then some of the other uh, factors that we have, like in-store uh, uh, presence and so on. So um, the, the price increase or the cost increase of cocoa is so important that really 80 percent of what we have to do is going to have to be a, through a straightforward price increase. Mm. We will uh, uh, do a little bit on the pack, but shrinkflation won't uh, solve this, uh, this inflation at this stage. How much more 
price increases do you think consumers can take, though? I mean, this came up on your conference call. It came up on the conference call of some of your competitors. This idea here that we have started to see a decline in spending on some of these products, not because of volume, but because of price. Yes, it depends largely of the of the categories, I would say. So our categories are uh, affordable indulgences. The out-of-pocket is not very high. The consumers are very close to the brands, Oreo, uh, Chips Ahoy, Toblerone, you name it. They, they, they really like those brands. They like the taste of those products. And so they can absorb a certain uh, price increase. Uh, as I was explaining, so far we haven't really noticed any effect on our volumes, mm -hmm. uh, to the contrary, I would say. So I assume that this is going to be the last one next year, that after that uh, things will calm down a little bit more inflation-wise. Uh, but yeah. I do believe that for next year we're still okay on the volume side I, of things. I mean, I, we're obviously talking holistically about your company and your brands as a whole. Are you seeing differences, though, based on the individual brands, based on uh, the income level of the consumer that would buy one brand versus the next? Are there nuances there in terms of uh, whether consumers are still taking those prices and those that aren't? Yes, consumers react to the price increases in different ways. Uh, uh, for instance, in North America, what we're seeing is that the, the consumers who have less income tend to shift their spending towards some of the discount channels, uh, clubs, and so on. Uh, they also tend to go more for multipacks, understanding that the unit price goes down if you buy bigger quantities. So they are adapting um, and changing the way they buy not necessarily giving up on, on buying our, our brands, but they do it in a more clever way. That's for sure something mm. we're seeing. In Europe, that reaction might be different, where they're going towards smaller uh, packs and uh, changing their frequency, going to some of the discounters also. So it's, it's a shift in channel and a shift in the size of the pack that they're buying. Dirk, we started off by talking about those weight loss drugs, the GLP-1 drugs. Um, let's end there because I noticed that you once worked at Novartis, the Swiss pharma company, for about a mm -hmm. year. From that industry's point of view, how exciting, how meaningful a development is this new class of weight loss drugs? Well, it's, it's, I assume, uh, I'm, I'm not in the pharmaceutical industry anymore, but I assume it's very exciting. Uh, I think what they see is, is a, a real potential of these drugs. I assume that Ozempic will probably be the biggest drugs in, drug in history uh, from a net revenue perspective. So for them, it's, it's, it's big. I think the, the, the main thing will be uh, keeping up with the capacity, having enough production capacity, making sure that the side effects are not too important, um, and seeing if there's real weight loss, because we, for instance, know at this stage that about 60% of the consumers are off the drug after a year. They regain about 65% of their weight. So there's still a lot of unknowns surrounding mm. this uh, that we will have to see. But for sure, it's, it's good news for them. All right, Dirk, really appreciate you taking time for us. Dirk Vandeput there, CEO and chairman over at Mondelez International. Look at the consumer spending space, look at the snack business, and now a pivot to what's going on in the world above us. SpaceX, we're just learning crossing the Bloomberg terminal right now, is set to book $9 billion in sales this year. According to people familiar with the situation here, that number could rise to about $15 billion in 2024. A rare look into the finances of a very closely held company, of course, a company controlled by Sir Elon Musk. Ed Ludlow joining us right now, the co-host of Bloomberg Technology. They'll walk us through uh, what we know here. And give us a sense here, Ed, $9 billion this year. Do we know what that's up from? It's basically double last year. Yeah. So there's kind of two stories. One, they are, they're growing revenues rapidly. But the, the key thing is going into next year, $15 billion of revenue. The majority of that's going to be Starlink, not sending rockets into space. Mm -hmm. and, and Elon Musk has talked in the past about how capped that business is. But if you're a, a potential investor out there and you want a slice of this action, a Starlink spin-off is what you've been eyeing well, for Well, just time. to be clear, when you say cap, you're talking about the satellite business, the idea that it's basically just one and done yeah. for, each, for each launch, right? So, so exactly. There's, there's a finite amount of money you can make sending rockets into space, yeah. carrying payload for a third party. Gotcha. Yeah. Not only is Starlink higher margin revenue, but you just keep adding subscribers and, and use the existing constellation and base, you make more money. And, you know, they've put some really big numbers out there about the future. But this is kind of contemporaneous. And, 
you know, big revenue growth with most of it coming from Starlink will be interesting to those that hope there will be a spin-off in the near future. I would, I mean, I, that's, that's got to be the question that everyone's asking, right? How did they participate? How did they get a piece of this? And is there any indication that there is going to be a spin-off or an IPO of Starlink or SpaceX? So Musk posted on X last week that the Starlink business has reached cash flow break even. Mm -hmm. That was one of the metrics that he said he wanted to see for an eventual spin-off but we haven't heard more about a spin-off. The other number that my colleagues and I are just reporting is that uh, EBITDA for this year is like $3.5 billion. So that gives you a sense of their overall uh, health of their finances on the bottom line. Will this be enough to push them to do something? We don't know that for certain, but I think that that's what the market will hope for. This is an Elon Musk-led company, which means that I'm sure there are other ambitions at work here beyond rocket launches and the satellite business. Do oh, big time. Do have any sense of what the next terrain is, frontier is for SpaceX? Look, uh, it goes back to Romain's question earlier. The launch business is capped. Mm -hmm. Starlink could be a cash cow, could make you know lots of very high margin revenue in, in the very near future. But all of that money is to meet SpaceX and Elon Musk's long-term goal of putting humans on Mars. And I know every time I say that, it's so hard to believe, but that is the ambition. And because it's a private company, it can move forward with that goal without the sort of restrictions that being a public company might bring you with such a vivid ambition. All right, Ed Ludlow, the co-host of Bloomberg Technology, uh, stopping by here with the latest uh, news crossing the terminal on, I guess, the valuation of SpaceX. We now know $9 billion in revenue this year, maybe going to 15 by next year, as Elon Musk uh, says Starlink could be the future of that business. And if you want to know everything about all of Elon Musk's uh, uh, ventures, uh, we have a new podcast that is launching called Elon Inc. It's a podcast from the Bloomberg team that breaks down the most important stories on Elon Musk and his empire. You can start listening tomorrow, wherever you get. I like that picture. Your podcast. By the way, of Elon's like head exploding. <laughs> With all the different ideas coming out of it because... Oh, are those his ideas? Well, there are ideas that he's going to be credited with, I'm sure. All right, coming up here on the big program, the election no one wants. That's the headline here with a record share of Americans holding unfavorable opinions of both presidential frontrunner candidates ahead of the 2024 election here in the U.S. We'll explain why after the break. This is Bloomberg. Folks, too many people have been left behind in the past or treated like they're invisible. We're building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up where no one's left behind. And that was President Biden trying to sell the public on his Bidenomics agenda earlier today. But with less than one year to go, before we get to the 2024 presidential election, new polls show most American voters are dissatisfied with both frontrunners. That includes the incumbent, Joe Biden, and his predecessor, Donald Trump. Joining us right now to discuss is Morning Consult political analyst Eli Yokely. And uh, Eli, uh, you know, for an election that typically comes down to a binary decision here, this doesn't sound like it bodes very well uh, for the outcome. Come. It's not a great start for President Biden right now. I mean, he's running neck and neck with President Trump in national surveys. We've seen a slate of state level polls, be it the New York Times survey or the Bloomberg Morning Consult survey from last month that showed him losing in, in key states. And in the surveys we did in swing states, I mean, we found that the Bidenomics, the American economy, is weighing very, very heavily on President Biden. Half of swing state voters think Bidenomics has been bad for them. That does not bode well for a president who's trying to make that, that term itself a key part of, of his reelection campaign. I, I am curious then, the flip side of that, of course, is your option would be, at least based on what we know now in terms of the polling, would probably be Donald Trump here. Now, we've already gotten four years of him, so we kind of know what his general policy outlines would be. Has he campaigned on anything that's materially different than what he did during his uh, first four years in office? I mean, most of his campaign has been grievance, which sells well with the Republican electorate. He's always been a base first politician trying to get his supporters out to show up and try to diminish his, the, the other side a bit. Um, he, he has not talked a ton about the economy to the extent of things that are elevated in the electorate. He seems very interested in talking about himself and relying on his legal troubles to rev up his supporters. But right now it's working. 
I mean, Joe Biden is a very weakened president at this point with his own base. And on the other hand, that's kind of the upshot for President Biden over the next year is the people he is struggling with right now are key parts of his Democratic base that he will be able to target, be them young people, be them black voters, be them women, who all are going to be key if he's going to pull off a victory next November. And, of course, how does the ongoing Israel-Hamas war play into the electorate's perception of the Biden administration versus how a potential President Trump might handle it? Yeah, I mean, right now, uh, the, the electorate is pretty split on Joe Biden's handling of the situation between Israel and Hamas. That's better than a lot of other issues, including the economy for him. I think the big question is how long this is going to last, whether he can resolve this issue or not over the next few months. I mean, clearly, the Biden camp, the Biden administration has been pushing very hard to try to find a ceasefire, try to find peace in the, in the region. Uh, but that's a big lift. It's been a big, big lift for a lot of presidents. Uh, I think the biggest question facing him is how long does this last? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see if he'll be an issue next November. Yeah. I'm wondering where things stand on fundraising uh, for the president um, currently and also for, you mentioned uh, former President Trump being able to really key off of uh, his legal problems as a way to fundraise, particularly with his base. What about President Biden at the moment? Because when you say Bidenomics, it really is just a reflection of the economy. So running on Bidenomics as a platform when the economy is slowing doesn't seem to be paying off uh, in terms of dividends. No, I mean, burning out Bidenomics is a good is a big challenge. When things are going well, voters are going to notice it. But when things maybe turn, uh, you've, you've given the Republicans a great branding exercise. You've done all the work for already. I think it's a big bet. Clearly, the White House is committed to it right now. The challenge for them has been the fact that the good stories about the economy just haven't been breaking through to voters. Voters are so much more likely to hear about a bad inflation report than they are a good jobs report. It's sort of the nature of how people consume news, but it's been a big challenge. I think that's why you've seen the president out on the, on, on the road campaigning on this and trying to leave this on voters' minds. Yeah, I, I am curious, and this is probably a question that you can't answer, but why don't we have more viable alternatives to either candidate? I mean, there's no real challenger at all to Biden last time I checked, and most of the challengers uh, to Trump, uh, I mean, let's just be blunt about it, don't really have a chance uh, at all. Right, at least right now. Dean Phillips Erasure. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, he, he announced his campaign um, <laughs> earlier this month. He's got 4% support. That's right at Marion Williamson. Joe Biden has a 69 point lead over his closest rival. On both sides of the aisle, about three and four voters want their front runner to be there. And so this is where we are right now. There's not a lot of energy among the electorate for a replacement right now. But but I, but sorry, I just have to push back on that because if, if the issue is that there's no alternative, I thought that's what the primary process was supposed to be, to sort of vet all the alternatives. And we're certainly not getting that on the Democratic side. And you can make an argument the Republican side is just kind of for show. Yeah. I mean, on the Republican side, and pretty consistently in our surveys, about two in five vote, voters support somebody other than Donald Trump. The problem on the Republican side is there's no consolidation. I mean, they're splintering all of this support that could be used to start building a formidable challenger toward him. I mean, these debates have been, been almost sideshows. They're running for second place, but to what extent when Donald Trump's at 60%? He is where the Republican base is, despite what Republican donors or people on Capitol Hill might want. Uh, this is where the Republican Party is. On the Democratic side, I mean, Joe Biden is an incumbent president, the party apparatus is generally supportive of those, and yeah. I think it'd be pretty hard for them to try to unseat him. All right, uh, Eli, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. We should point out, of course, we have uh, state and local elections uh, tomorrow, November 7th here in the U.S., and that debate no one pays attention to, another Republican debate on Wednesday. Eli Yokely there over at Morning Consult. Stick with us. We're going to set you up for what to watch tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's push ahead to what markets are going to have their eye on on Tuesday in Scarlet. You've been wanting Fed speak. You're about to get it. <laughs> I know. I, I take my pick, right? Uh, Neil Kashkari will be speaking with Bloomberg Television at 7.30 a.m., and he is a voting member of the FOMC. Mm -hmm. we yeah, absolutely. And other Fed members as well, including Barr, uh, Waller, Williams, and Logan, and earnings season. 
continues to roll on. Earnings season continues in the morning. We're going to hear from Uber. We're going to hear from KKR as well as DR Horton. So look at the home building industry, which I'm, of course, fascinated by, given that no one is moving anywhere and interest rates are so high. <laughs> well, that's before the bell, after the bell. You're going to get some electric car makers like Rivian and Lucid. You're going to get eBay as well, as well as Occidental. And Robinhood. Remember we used to always talk about Robinhood? Yeah, that's kind of yeah. died down, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I don't know. I miss the meme stock era. And we got uh, a set of Treasury auctions. Mm -hmm. We start tomorrow, I believe, with what? Uh, the short-term notes, right? Yes, that's yeah. right. And eventually at 1 p.m., the three-year treasury auction as well. Uh, you know, supply, supply, supply. It's a big theme. All right, thanks for joining us here. We'll be back tomorrow. Balance of Power is coming up next. This is Bloomberg.